we're gonna we're gonna call this meeting to order and I just want to say that we have roughly about two hours thank you all for your patience I know it was a long hearing um, in two hours we have a party next door we don't, we're not being asked to run out of here but we may very well be run out <laughs> and so uh, we will try to go through this as expeditiously as possible uh, so good afternoon, I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. During today's hearing, we will review the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's $1.7 billion fiscal 2020 operating budget, specifically the approximately $816.3 million allocated to the Division of Mental Hygiene. We will also address the relevant performance indicators from fiscal year 2019, preliminary mayor's management report and the fiscal 2019 capital commitment plan. I would like to start by addressing my concern that even in the midst of the continued opioid epidemic that continues to devastate our country and our city, the only new, sorry, new need that received funding for New York City Well Quality Assurance, uh, sorry, because I am like a little bit blind. I would like to start by addressing my concern that even in the midst of the continued opioid epidemic that continues to devastate our country and our city, the only new need that received funding was for New York City Wall Quality Assurance. I think it's vital that we continue to think of new and innovative programs to ensure that we are combating this epidemic. In addition, New York has rising rates of meth use and alcohol abuse and we aren't even talking about it. We need to be addressing all forms of substance use and ensuring that there is enough funding. It's concerning that these alternate substance, substances such as cocaine are now being cut with fentanyl, which has become one of the leading causes of overdose deaths. Funding is needed to find and eliminate the source of fentanyl. I look forward to hearing about improvements and changes in harm reduction strategies. In addition, I'd like to state my frustration that it has been almost a full year since the City Council expressed its support to, for supervised injection facility or SIFS. This science has proven how effective SIFs can be against overdose, HIV and hepatitis C, and yet there is no official rollout plan or money in the budget to implement when the red tape put up by the state is torn down. It is imperative that we utilize any tool available in our battle against substance abuse and overdose, and we hope that you, uh, that you will continue to assist in this goal. I commend New York City and its endeavor to provide access to affordable health care. I just want to make sure that mental health service services, access for the disabled, and support for substance use are being included as part of New York City care. The number of homeless who are suffering from mental illness, disability, substance use, or all three continues to rise. The number of older adults with mental health diagnosis has increased in the last decade. I know there, is a, there has been a proposal to increase funding for Thrive Geriatric Mental Health, but it's not enough. In addition, there has been an increase in substance use and suicides with veterans and CBOs on the ground level aren't receiving enough funding to help reduce this. There should be specific funding set aside to work with these populations and ensure that they have access to all forms of health care. Finally, I'd like to commend you, Commissioner, and the Division of Mental Hygiene for the work that is being done and look forward to continuing the conversation and what else can be done. I would like to thank committee staff, finance analyst Lauren Hunt, policy analyst Chrissy Dwyer, and committee counsel Sarah List. You will now be sworn in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good afternoon, Chair Ayala, members of the committee. I am Dr. Oxides Barbeau, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I am joined by Sandy Raza, Deputy Commissioner for Finance, and Dr. Hillary Cunnins, Acting Executive Deputy Commissioner for Mental Hygiene. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the department's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2020. Medicine and public health have been my battlegrounds for social justice throughout my career. I have sought to address a stark reality. For far too long, zip codes have determined how long or how well individuals have lived. I know all too well the outsized role that the social determinants of health, such as housing, education, and socioeconomic status can play in an individual's and a community's health. I also know firsthand the effects that mental illness can have on individuals, family, friends, and a community. As health commissioner, I am squarely focused on putting communities, and particularly immigrants, at the heart of our work. 
This is critical to tackling our biggest challenges from the opioid overdose epidemic and mental illness to chronic diseases and HIV AIDS. Integrating mental and physical health approaches along with bridging public health and healthcare delivery will be pivotal strategies in closing the gap of racial health inequities. I am proud and excited to lead the health department to make New York City not only the strongest and healthiest city in the, in the United States, but a more just and equitable city where everyone can realize their full health potential. The work the health department undertakes around mental health is vast and varied. Broadly, we are focused on three areas. Prevention, raising awareness, reducing stigma, and creating more supportive environments to prevent mental health crises before they begin. Treatment, providing opportunities to connect people with care and enhancing the existing mental health care delivery system. And three, support, so that those who are living with mental illness and developmental disabilities can do so to their fullest potential. The health department does not do this work alone. I want to thank the community-based organizations, service providers, my fellow commissioners, and their staff, and many others who are working tirelessly every day. I also want to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Ayala, and others in the council for their leadership on these efforts. I want to start by highlighting a few areas of focus in the past year. In 2018, we focused significant resources on addressing the opioid overdose epidemic through Healing NYC. Launched in 2017, Healing NYC's $60 million a year investment increased the city's capacity to respond to the crisis in partnership with communities and healthcare and social service providers. Last year, we expanded our public messaging campaigns through Living Proof, a citywide media awareness campaign that features New Yorkers who are receiving medication for addiction treatment. These ads highlight that effective treatment for opioid use disorder is available and challenge the stigma around addiction and medications for addiction treatment. I want to thank the brave New Yorkers who shared their stories for this campaign in order to bring addiction out of the shadows and encourage others to seek effective treatment. Although we are making progress, the opioid overdose epidemic continues to claim too many lives, and certain neighborhoods are disproportionately affected. In November, the administration announced $8 million to the Bronx Action Plan, which recognizes the South Bronx outsized burden of fatal drug overdose and dedicates additional Healing NYC resources in these neighborhoods. Through this plan, we are educating Bronxites on the dangers of fentanyl and engaging people who use drugs and connecting them to care and other services. We also empower community organizations to help their neighbors. I want to thank Chair Ayala and Council Member Salamanca for their steadfast focus on the opioid overdose crisis in their communities and for bringing attention to the specific needs of the Bronx in this epidemic. We have also deepened our partnership with the NYPD and FDNY, putting public health approaches at the forefront of the city's response for individuals in crisis. In 2018, we launched Health Engagement and Assessment Teams, or HEAT. These teams, comprised of mental health professionals and peer workers, provide health-focused support and resources to people referred by public safety agencies and through targeted canvassing. Five HEAT teams operate 16 hours a day throughout New York City. In addition, we expanded the co-response model from 8 to 16 hours a day. Three co-response teams comprised of two NYPD officers and a DOHMH mental health clinician were deployed almost 1,800 times last year to provide a public health response to individuals in crisis. Additionally, we made progress towards opening up two diversion centers, one in the Bronx and one in East Harlem. The centers will open in the fall and will provide the NYPD with an alternative for arrest or hospitalizations for individuals with mental health, substance use, and other social service needs. The health diversion centers will offer short-term stabilizing services and referrals to long-term care. Finally, through Thrive NYC, the city is enhancing mental health services and behavioral support programs in every school. 
using a three-tiered model of universal selective and targeted services, we have implemented intensive training for school staff, enhanced group services for students at risk, and provided new individual services for students with identified mental health needs. When I started at the health department in 2003, there was only one staff person overseeing school mental health services for the Department of Education. Today, through the investments of Thrive, 134 health department staff support the mental health expansion across the education system, and every public school now has access to mental health services. I will now turn to the preliminary budget. I am pleased to report that mental hygiene and early intervention have approximately 900 employees and are and an operating budget of eight, $816 million, of which $369 million is city tax levy. The remainder is federal and state dollars. Under the de Blasio administration, city tax levy funding for mental hygiene services has grown by 167%, from $138 million in fiscal year 2014 to over $369 million in this year's preliminary plan. This represents an unprecedented commitment to strengthening the mental health care system in New York City and addressing the opioid overdose epidemic. Most of the funding increase is due to the investments under Thrive NYC and Healing NYC, which allowed us to implement new public health approaches to mental health as well as expand existing programming. Thrive NYC started a long needed conversation about mental health and its role in individual and community health. However, it does not stand alone. It is integrated into the longstanding work of the health department, complements the existing mental health care delivery system, and builds on the great work that community-based organizations have been doing for years. I am grateful to this administration and the First Lady's leadership for bringing mental wellness to the forefront of our conversation about health. The preliminary fiscal year 2020 budget allocates approximately $1.3 million to expand two key projects, including $500,000 and four new staff to improve the experience New Yorkers have when they contact NYC Well. New Yorkers have continued to contact NYC Well for 24-7 crisis counseling, peer support, and information about and referral to behavioral health services. In 2018, NYC Well answered nearly 260,000 calls, texts, and chats, and made over 49,000 referrals to behavioral health services and supports. The new funds will ensure that New Yorkers receive the best possible crisis intervention, counseling, and support from NYC Well. The preliminary budget also adds $792,000 to enhance the capacity of four syringe service programs in the South Bronx and Washington Heights. This funding will support expanded outreach and engagement with people who use drugs and delivery of harm reduction services in parks and areas with public drug use. The city's actions to address mental wellness and opioids are unprecedented. However, more could be done with support from Washington. I want to highlight one key item that I recently spoke about with our representatives on Capitol Hill. Today, every physician in New York City can write a prescription for an opioid, but only a fraction can prescribe medication for the treatment of addiction. That isn't right. It shouldn't be easier to write a prescription for an opioid than it is to write a prescription for medication to treat addiction. The department has trained more than 1,500 physicians to prescribe buprenorphine since 2016, and there were a total of 2,358 physicians in New York City who prescribed the medication in 2018. But in the midst of a crisis, we need to eliminate structural barriers to treatment. Every physician should be equipped to treat their patients. Congress should act immediately to eliminate, eliminate regulatory barriers that prevent physicians from providing methadone and buprenorphine to individuals in need. I urge our representatives in Washington look, to look into this issue further, and I would appreciate your voices on this important matter as well. It is clear that the administration and city council are committed to addressing mental health needs of the city. 
With your help, we will work tirelessly to enhance prevention and treatment of me mental illness, limit the toll of op opioids, and ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or immigration status, have an equal chance to enjoy fulfilling, successful, and healthy lives. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So I don't want to hammer away at Thrive because we, we've done that enough today, but I, I wonder if, uh, if you would share with us what your feelings are in terms of the budget. Do you feel like there's enough money in the budget currently to address the seriously mentally ill outside of the Thrive program? So as health commissioner, I'm always happy to take more money. And currently, we have $300 million that we invest on a yearly basis to treat serious mental illness. And I think it's important to sort of take an opportunity to really clarify what it is that we mean when we say serious mental illness and what the spectrum of services are that we provide. So when we talk about serious mental illness, what we're talking about is when an individual has a mental disorder such as schizophrenia, major depression, um, or bipolar that results in serious functional, functional impairment of one or two of their major life activities. And so while serious mental illness may not be preventable, there are things that we can do to minimize the impact of an, on an individual's life and really focus on the central theme of maximizing the number of people that we maintain in their communities thriving and not in hospitals and not in the criminal justice system. So that spectrum of services um, starts with something called NYC START, which is a program where we made first episode psychosis a reportable condition. And under the de Blasio administration, we actually lowered the age from 18 to 16 for it to be a reportable condition. And the reason for that is that individuals who suffer first episode psychosis are really at the highest risk of becoming, uh, of having their, one of their major life activities impaired by that. And so what we have demonstrated is that um, we are successful in engaging a high percentage, like 87% of people within the first 30 days into care, and that really sets them up for being successful. The other end of the spectrum in terms of prevention is um, the money that we invest in supportive housing. So on a yearly basis, we invest $181 million in supportive housing. Currently, the city has over 8,700 units, 80% 80 of which are allocated for individuals with serious mental illness. And so then what happens in between is a series of initiative and pro initiatives and programs that are targeted at um, uh, providing crisis response, mobile response, and really interfacing with the clinical community. Again, the, the ultimate goal being um, linking people into care as quickly as possible so that they can remain in the community and not in hospitals or in the criminal justice system. I was uh, coincidentally was reading on the uh, supportive housing piece. There was a, there was a piece in the New York Times, um, I think that was released in December, um, that highlighted the, uh, the failures of the, of the state uh, in, in regards to individuals that had been maybe in some sort of institutionalized setting um, and then were released into some sort of, not, not necessarily even supportive housing, but independent living uh, facilities where you know, they were not responsible for paying their own bills and taking their own medication. Um, does, does the Department of Health track those individuals uh, as well? Because I, I mean, based on that, that, that story, um, it, it seemed like it was not really meeting the goals that I, I, I'm assuming the state intended and there were individuals that, you know, had become homeless, that there were some instances where individuals passed away because they weren't properly caring for themselves. So let me start by saying that we have um, strong partnerships with the state and we work through contracted providers in terms of um, ensuring that 
the services that come with supportive housing uh, maintain uh, a particular quality level because it's not just the housing, it's also the wraparound services that come um, with that. And the article refers to the adult home initiative that's not through the uh, DOHMH program that we oversee. And I'll let Dr. Cunnan speak more to that. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, just to add, the article I believe you're referring to, council member, is the adult home program that's run out of OMH, and it's not under uh, DOHMH or city oversight. No, I understood, but I wonder if there's any coordination. Is, is, is the state talking to you about these facilities as we're putting more and more? As, you know, my concern is this. The, we've seen an increase of what would be considered, you know, a person with a mentally chronically Ill, uh, illness, uh, you know, on the streets, in our subways, in our jails. And I wonder if there's a direct correlation between the state's decision to close so many, high, uh, you know, psychiatric beds uh, and place individuals in more of a individualized setting, if that makes any sense. No, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I just want to sort of step back for a moment and make the point that um, the majority of individuals who are homeless do not have a mental illness. Sure. Um, that being said, we, through the Department of Health, invest on an annual basis roughly $17 million in terms of uh, providing, through contractors, direct clinical services in shelters uh, for individuals with mental health issues. And then we also fund, through the Department of Homeless Services, uh, teams that go out and do outreach uh, for individuals that are um, street homeless or that may be in subways. I, I happen to work with a lot of those programs in my district, uh, 125th Street, you know, has been um, kind of the epicenter of a lot of that. Uh, and and what I, I will share is that it's very difficult when you, you can't physically pick somebody up, even if they, they are suffering from some sort of chronic, you know, mental illness and are exhibiting some, you know, behavioral issues on the street, you can't just physically pick somebody up unless they actually hurt somebody and put them in, you know, in the hospital or get them the care that they need. And so what I see in my district, and I think that, you know, uh, Councilman Beholden has alluded to this a couple of times as well, is that we're basically allowing them to live independently on our streets until such time as something happens. And that's something in my district a few months ago, we had an individual who stabbed someone, uh, you know, on the back. He stabbed him so hard, he, the, the knife needed to be surgically removed. Um, and we, we know that these individuals exist. We know them by name, you know, these are, you know, we, they're family at this point. Um, but the, the fact that we can't really help them unless they allow us to help them because state laws prevent us from really you know, truly addressing a lot of these, these issues. I mean, if a person, it, it's, it's almost the equivalent of asking a child whether or not, you know, they're in need of services. You know, if you are not in the, in the right mental state of mind, how do you, how do you agree to medication? How do you agree to, to uh, you know, counseling or any, any other resources that may be beneficial? So I'll start and then I'll let Dr. Cunnins weigh in. You know, I think that the, um, the incidents that you highlight are um, obviously things that are very concerning and that as a city we are working hard to reduce the number of people who are homeless um, and especially engage individuals who may be homeless and have mental illness. And you know, the point that you bring up really is an opportunity to stress the fact that um, it is that ongoing engagement and relationship building to help individuals um, meet them where they are and help them on a continuum to accessing services and to ultimately become housed. Um, we have a number of teams that provide uh, mobile crisis services. Um, we have teams that, you know, depending on whether an individual is presenting as potentially uh, violent or is pre presenting potentially as having 
uh, other medical issues, there are different teams that can be deployed. So for example, um, we have recently stood up what we call health uh, engagement and treatment teams, the HEAT teams, and these are uh, individuals, there's five teams throughout the city and their job is to develop those relationships and link individuals to community-based organizations, to link them to services um, through other city agencies. And it's a process. But is the HEAT team different than the, than the NYPD's co-response team? Yes, they are. How, it sounds pretty similar. So um, the co-response teams have uh, two NYPD officers and a DOHMH clinician, whereas the HEAT teams have uh, a peer as well as a DOHMH uh, clinician. And they're really both intended to um, take a public health approach to these encounters and not criminalize events that are mental health focused and, and really lead with compassion and a public health focus. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Holden has a question on this. Yes, I have to run to another meeting, but then I'll come back. Um, so, uh, Commissioner, thanks for your testimony. I just have a question on these uh, co-response teams as a follow-up to Chair Ayala's uh, questions. Uh, do, do, do you go in the subway with these, because I think you have three teams, you said, three co-response teams? Um, the co-response is more than three. Um, permit me, please, to just five. Five? Five? Do you go in the subways? We don't go in the And we don't go in the subways. Why not? Uh, I'll defer to Dr. Cohen. Um, what the, this, and I think as, uh, uh, good afternoon, council member. Um, I think as you heard in the prior hearing, um, and I appreciate your comments earlier about the subways, there are other outreach teams in subways managed by Department of Social Services. Uh, and so these teams are street-based teams, both co-response and HEAT. Uh, and just to circle back to, I think, uh, the prior question is the idea of engaging someone over time with a health-led response given the constraints of um, some of the laws that you mentioned, Council Member Ayala, as well as the importance of offering people and engaging them in health is the approach that both co-response and HEAT has taken. Yeah, well, I would love you guys in the subway, though, because um, whatever is being done by social services is, is not working, or it's not enough. So if we had Thrive, if we had you guys, if we had teams sweeping the subways and trying to get, I understand the law, but I understand also how people feel riding the subways and are, we're trapped. My wife won't ride the subways anymore because of incidents. Everybody, I, I think everybody in this room has experienced something in the subways. Everybody at that hearing across the, the way experienced something in the subways. Most New Yorkers will tell you that when those doors close, we, uh, we're at the mercy of an individual that might go off at any second. And there's too many of them. So getting to getting these uh, response teams, when you're out eight to six, 16 hours a day, well, you, you're, you are 16 hours a day. You went from 8 to 16. Um, if we can get even to 24, because there are incidents almost every, actually every day in the subway, um, of a person that, can, that needs help. And sometimes you could, you could arrive at the conclusion very quickly that there's a problem here. So I understand um, if, if your budget would consider getting your response teams. Who, do you know who makes up the social service teams, their response teams? Um, I don't, but I wanna circle back to one thing you say and just really make the point, you know, that I hear what you're saying, but the reality is that the vast number of individuals with mental health issues who are in the subways actually uh, don't present a threat and they are more often uh, likely to be the victims of violence, and so I think this is... Uh, yeah, we, we heard that, but I don't think New Yorkers will agree with you, um, because we're, we're law-abiding, we're, we're going to work, we're going back and forth, and yet somebody, it's just a matter of time, somebody walks in and starts screaming and yelling, and when 
when, when uh, Susan Herman spoke at the la our last hearing, she said, we're seeing the benefits of the subway of Thrive NYC. As a coincidence, my, I had uh, so many complaints about the M line where the homeless had taken over and were actually threatening individuals on a daily basis. And then they swept it. Um, we had NCOs sweep the subways, social services came in, but it's back. And, and there is a situation, again, when we're confined in a subway car that's very unnerving and we have people exposing themselves, we have so many incidents that we need a greater push from your, your area certainly thrive and social services. So we need a team effort to sweep the subways and make people, because ridership is down. Like I said, my wife won't take, she takes the express bus and pays double for the experience and a much longer commute. My daughter, who's four months pregnant, will not get in the seven line anymore because of the incidents. So when that's happening, uh, just in my family, and then once we put this on Facebook and social, other social media, we got so many people chiming in saying, my, uh, they were out uh, on a trip to uh, Manhattan, uh, a daughter, uh, a mother and a daughter, and they were accosted twice on two different lines. And again, they don't want to take the subways. So we have it. We need to address it. And we need to address it more aggressively. Um, you could just see it every day. You, you've seen it. You, you, everybody has. So um, but if we can put a budget item in for to expand the, uh, the co-response team, I would appreciate it. I think most New Yorkers would. Um, also, I just want to touch upon the opioid epidemic that we're uh, experiencing. Um, we had a hearing where NYPD was going to look at charging dealers of fentanyl and opioids um, if, if their customers um, died, have an overdose and died, that they would be charged with manslaughter or homicide. Um, do you help with that situation? We'd like to see that expanded, where there would be a definite uh, reperco repercussions to dealers who, de who are dealing death on a, on a daily basis. So um, have you worked with NYPD on that? So council member, let me first begin by saying our, our approach to the opioid epidemic is leading with a public health response to uh, reduce the number of individuals who die as a result of opioids, uh, and we do not participate in that particular activity. Because uh, I, you know, if it, I, I'd like to get uh, numbers on the NYPD, and I hope um, because that would start to address that we actually lock people up who are dealing this uh, these opioids, uh, and and uh, just don't get arrested and get out of jail, and they're back doing it. That we really get serious with these individuals who have caused people to perish, and I think that th they cause their death by dealing these drugs. Uh, so I think we need to address that in a more aggressive uh, way, in certainly in YPD. Um, but another thing, where I'm not seeing, just in one year, I've seen doctors afraid to, to prescribe opioids. Uh, I've seen it drop, which is encouraging, because when I broke my ribs in 2017, I was given an opioid automatically in the hospital without me asking. I, I could have taken Tylenol um, if I had a choice, but they gave me that. Um, I've spoken to many, several doctors and asked that they say it's tougher and they say they're being watched, I think. Um, are you uh, working with the doctors who prescribe the opioids? Are you, are you looking at who's doing it and who's doing it the most? So one of the components of the spectrum of services that we've implemented under uh, both Healing NYC and prior to the investment of Healing NYC was to work with providers on what we call judicious prescribing of opioids, and Dr. Cunnins and her team led those efforts. And uh, we did what's called a uh, detailing campaign where we went to provider offices to educate them about the risks of uh, prescribing opioids and giving them concrete suggestions about uh, alternatives to treating patients with pain uh, in a way that wasn't putting them at risk for um, opioid misuse. Thank you, Bob. 
also, um, Commissioner, you stated that there's a $300 million budget for mental health services, right? Is that? $300 million for SMI. Okay. And how is that money used? How do you break that money down? So, um, as I mentioned, uh, the SMI has a component of uh, NYC START, and that is a, an initiative for first episode psychosis. Um, under that, um, sorry, I just lost my, okay. oh, here we go. Um, under that NYC SAFE, and then we have mobile uh, response, crisis response, we also include uh, crisis respite beds, um, and that's $2.5 million. And then as I mentioned, uh, the supportive housing is $181 million. Um, what I didn't mention is that in this continuum of services for individuals who may be non-compliant with the mobile teams that we provide, we also then uh, utilize um, AOT and under the de Blasio administration we've seen a 28% increase in the number of people who use uh, AOT. AOT okay. In the uh, in the public awareness uh, campaign uh, this is an opioid related uh, question um, I know that when we were in the midst of the the K2 epidemic <clears throat> that public awareness campaign was really, you know, in, vital because it allowed individuals for the first time to really be educated on the effects of synthetic marijuana. I think, you know, until then, you know, most people assumed that because it was being sold in delis across, you know, the city, that it was okay to purchase and that, you know, it was, you know, harmless. Um, so, but I wonder how much of the attention on the public awareness campaign um, has been designed to really speak to individuals that are not necessarily addicted to opioids, but that may be smoking synthetic marijuana, buying pills on the street, using cocaine that may all very well may be laced with uh, fentanyl. Because I think most people, there's an, a, a direct association between the opioids and fentanyl, but no, you know, we're not necessarily hearing a lot, at least I'm not hearing a lot you know, on the streets, uh, that people are making that same correlation, you know, to cocaine and, you know, just are being a little bit more aware. So I'll start and then I'll uh, hand it over to Dr. Cunnins. Um, we, through the efforts in stemming the opioid epidemic, have done a number of media campaigns, right? One of them was um, look, destigmatizing access to medication uh, treatment, so buprenorphine, methadone, and, and really opening the conversation of the importance of, of getting access to treatment. Another uh, aspect of uh, public education that we did was around fentanyl and the dangers of fentanyl. And we actually have uh, a couple of uh, things in the pipeline, if you will, to, to further educate New Yorkers about uh, the extent to which fentanyl is affecting uh, various components of uh, what people may be uh, misusing. Uh, I'll just add a, a little bit to that, which is we have a, uh, as the commissioner, as Commissioner Barbo just mentioned, a fentanyl specific campaign focused on people who might be using stimulants or cocaine. We've done some targeted advertising or public awareness dissemination one was a bar campaign. Another one is through our, what we call our rapid assessment response teams, disseminating the information very locally in the South Bronx right now, going into Washington Heights, particularly around cocaine or uh, messages aimed, risks of fentanyl being mixed into cocaine use. Uh, we have a new Facebook ad up uh, just uh, yesterday or the day before that is aiming to educate uh, younger people about the use of pills and something called lean, uh, which we're happy to send you the link, um, as a way to get to new audiences through social media. So we're using a variety of communication strategies. The biggest ones which you've probably seen are the ones that Dr. Barbeau just mentioned. Is there any campaign to attract the attention of older adults who may be becoming addicted to prescription drugs? So we've, we've 
uh, we have done the work, uh, that work around educating uh, people who might be getting prescribed pills through the detailing campaigns. We're aiming there to put out messages through health provider settings since older people might be more likely, although not exclusively so, getting prescription pills. And so as part of our detailing and outreach to provider offices, we always have patient education materials. Uh, we've distributed those both in the context of detailing campaigns as well as when we're doing outreach to health systems, uh, drug treatment programs, uh, harm reduction programs, and so forth, messaging about risk of pill use. I think that it would make sense to maybe partner with the Department for the Aging uh, as well. We've been, my staff and I have been actually doing uh, naloxone training, so we've, you know, we've been partnering with um, some community groups to provide these trainings at our local senior centers, and it, it seems to us, first of all, they love it, you know, and uh, they want to talk about it, but they're always really surprised to learn of the number of older adults that have become addicted as a result of pain management. Uh, absolutely, and we have shared our materials in the past with Department of Aging. We have uh, uh, done some trainings with them around substance use issues for older adults, and we're happy to continue to do that. I appreciate that. Now, in regards to the uh, the rollout of the, the Bronx plan last year around the opioid to, uh, epidemic, um, how is that going? What is the status? I know that, you know, it was a pretty decent winter. It, it, we, we seem to have kind of stabilized. I'm not sure if that's uh, something that we can attribute to uh, this uh, influx of services, or is it, you know, weather related? Is it a combination of two? So how, how many of the programs that were intended to be funded through this initiative have actually been rolled out? So I'll start and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Cunnins. Um, you know, I think that since uh, we did that walkabout with you and Council Member Salamanca and other members of the administration uh, and launched the Bronx Action Plan, we have deployed uh, heat teams uh, for the 16-hour uh, shifts. We've engaged uh, hundreds, if not close to hundreds of in individuals to make referrals, to link them to care. We have also engaged business owners uh, to share with them what we're doing and to get from them feedback about what other things they would like to be seeing. We have um, worked with parks in terms of uh, minimizing the number of syringes that are found in public spaces, and actually our teams canvas for that to make sure that we're not seeing uh, backsliding on that, and I'm pleased to report that we are seeing in many uh, parks either zero to just a handful and our teams are out there on a regular basis and they will continue to be out there. What is the team exactly tasked with doing that's creating such a significant change? I'm sorry, say again? What is, what is, the, team's, what is, the, what is the team actually doing in the parks uh, that has contributed to the, decli the, the decline of the number of syringes that we're seeing? So the, the, our teams are engaging with individuals and then we have a contractor who's doing the actual um, pickup uh, as is parks. So it's not that individuals are no longer getting high in the parks, in our local parks, but rather that now there are other people there ready to engage them and to ensure proper disposal of the needles, is that correct? Well, I, I think it's a combination, and I'll let Dr. Cunnan speak more details about that. Um, I think, like I said, we've made referrals for people to get into treatment. Okay. Um, so I can't say kind of what the balance, how it has shifted just yet. Um, I also, I add, I mean, to, there, there's been the funding made of, was made available to increase the presence of health-oriented help, including heat teams that. Commissioner Barbeau just mentioned, including additional funding to the syringe service programs who then can have more of a presence to engage people, both around educating, around safer syringe disposal, uh, all, as well as services that are available. Uh, do, you, do you know how many people that have been, how many of the people that have been approached have 
uh, said, you know, I, 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 wanna, I wanna sign up for services, like I wanna receive services. How, do, how many people have been connected? So, do you track that? We do track that and, um, and we're getting the answer as we speak. <laughs> Um, so we've so the our heat teams that are the uh, health department uh, focused teams have in, uh, done 4,000 encounters to the commissioner's point. We've distributed more than a thousand naloxone kits, provided directly more than a hundred service linkages. Um, this is probably an underestimate to what we 20, I'm sorry, more than a hundred service provisions. Um, we do track people uh, and offer referrals to all of them. This does not include, and I would have to get back to you on this, uh, about additional encounters made by the harm reduction programs who have also increased their presence in parks. Could you, could you explain, because I, I, this is a, a program I actually haven't heard enough about, the four syringe service programs, like yes. what, what, is, what is that? Okay. So uh, we are, we, um, thank you for the question. We are um, uh, engaged in a process of a little bit of rebranding of the syringe exchange programs to reflect really the kind of broader array of services and engagement, linkage to healthcare, linkage to mental health care, uh, care management or case management that our syringe exchange programs or syringe service programs are engaged with. So these programs with the additional funding under healing, uh, so additional funding under Bronx Action Plan uh, are really, uh, I think, reflect a larger change in how we address people who use drugs. These are centers that can address people's needs broadly. They have for a long time, but under the de Blasio administration have become better funded and are better able to meet a broader range of needs. So that terminology just reflects our intention to convey this broader approach. And are, are all syringe exchange program providers uh, required to assist in the cleanup of the syringes that are improperly disposed of? Because what I hear from providers is usually it's not written in our contract, it's not our responsibility, we can help, and then we have other groups that are like, you know, very actively engaged in their communities and um, are going beyond the scope of their contractual obligations and, you know, being a little bit more proactive about ensuring that needles are not showing up in our playgrounds. Right. So I think in principle, all of the syringe service programs would like to be able to help with this. And in the, before the Bronx Action Plan, there was no dedicated funding for them to do that. So it was always a balancing act between wanting to address the individual needs of clients, participants, uh, but also being good neighbors and good community members and, and helping with that work. What the Bronx Action Plan affords us uh, as a city is some resources to support uh, some of the cleanup by syringe service programs, as well as importantly, our colleagues from, from parks and other agencies. But is that just specific to the Bronx Action Plan or is that, is that also uh, cover Staten Island, you know, Washington Heights? So uh, I'll have to refer you to our, the Department of Parks for some additional information and about how they're using the new funding more broadly in terms of syringe service program uh, involvement. It's been uh, both in the Bronx and then Upper Manhattan. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's always been like my, my biggest critique of the, the program is we want to make sure that if individuals are going to use that they're using and not, you know, uh, spreading uh, illnesses amongst themselves and that they're doing it safely. But at the same time, you know, we're exposing the general population if these same needles are then improperly disposed of in our communities. And I think that that's why we're seeing a lot of resistance from the communities, right, um, that we're providing these services in because they feel like they have somehow been, you know, uh, abandoned. Um, so it has to be somebody's problem. Absolutely, and I do want to highlight as part of the syringe service program contracts and what they do routinely is to educate participants about safe syringe disposal as well as supplying me means to dispose of syringes safely through something called fit packs, which are small, small disposal um, containers or other ways of, to do that, but we absolutely agree. Now in the Bronx, I know Commissioner, um, Rodriguez from the Parks Department actually uh, 
installed kiosks in several of the parks, not as a means of encouraging individuals from using in the local parks, but if they were using there already and improperly disposing of the needles so that they would at least you know, consider disposing of them in the kiosks. Have the kiosks been successful? Um, I know that I, I, I believe in Patterson uh, uh, Playground, which is in my district. Uh, it seems to be working. St. Mary's is kind of hit or miss. So in the areas where our heat teams have been canvassing and we are seeing um, decreased uh, syringes or caps on the ground, you know, it's challenging to know whether it's because they're being picked up or whether individuals are using the mechanisms that Dr. Cunnins was referring to. Um, I think the important thing here is that we are able to document and quantify many, many, many fewer uh, syringes in, in the areas where we had visited together. Does, does any, uh, any part of this budget include funding for uh, the fentanyl strips? I hear is, there's always a, a desire to have more of those. I'm gonna defer to Dr. Cunnins on that. So we, um, we do fund fentanyl strips through the, uh, our contractual relationships with the syringe service program. So if they would like to include that in their budget, we are happy to let them do so. I should add that we've also provided some guidance which uh, helps programs speak to clients about how to use strips and the circumstances under which they might, a person might choose to, to use a strip. Okay. Is there any update from the state on the four uh, safe injection sites? So I feel like I asked this question last year and there still was nothing and here we are a year later. What is the status? Yeah, um, so we are clear that the evidence on the effectiveness of opioid prevention centers uh, is strong in terms of its ability to uh, be a part of uh, interventions that save lives. And so we are waiting on the state to give us uh, a decision. And in the meantime, we're working with our partners to make sure that we've got uh, things queued up so that when we get word, we can hit the ground running. I mean, but has the State Dep uh, Department of Health indicated whether or not we're close to a decision? I mean, because we've been waiting for over a year now. Um, I have not heard uh, how close they are to a decision, um, but I am certain that they are talking about it and we are anxiously awaiting. Now, in, in the meantime, is the city then uh, having conversations with all of the, I'm assuming that there's been buy-in already from the elected officials representing those communities. Uh, I believe that one of the, uh, the other criteria was buy-in from the district attorneys. Um, have the district attorneys indicated that they'd be amenable to having one of these in their borough? So I'm gonna defer to Dr. Cunnins on that because I'm not certain about the details. Uh, so I think uh, two, two of the New York City district attorneys have indicated publicly their approval or uh, their willingness to have an OPC in their borough. That is DA Vance and DA Gonzalez. Um, and there are there have been a variety of conversations that will continue with with elected officials uh, and community members. Okay. Um, can you tell us what capital projects are anticipated for fiscal year 2020? So, capital projects um, specific to mental health. Specific to mental health. I don't think there there are none. There aren't any, okay. Um, and how much of the DOHMH's 611.1 million 10-year capital strategy will be assigned for mental health disabilities and addiction service expansion? So for the capital budget, um, there there is, to my knowledge, if I'm looking at, yeah, there's nothing for expansion of mental health clinics. Okay. The, in regards to the uh, the budget for developmental disabilities, it's thirteen million four hundred and forty nine. It doesn't ever seem to really increase, and I know that you subcontract a lot of the uh, the services. Um, is there any intention to uh, to raise that budget? So, you know, this is a situation where the 
state uh, does its contracting with CBOs directly. So what we provide is uh, funding to help uh, augment and uh, identify where there are gaps. So for example, um, we provide uh, funding through Thrive to help create more employment opportunities for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and that's a way in which we uh, work to really uh, leverage the dollars and the services that the state are funding directly. Okay. Is there a contingency plan for the state and federal government go through with the anticipated cuts to Article 6 for school-based clinics? So I have done uh, visits to Albany uh, to ensure that we educate our elected officials about the implications uh, for those cuts. And um, I, we haven't heard yet. Uh, for the Article 6 cuts, those have been rejected in the both one house bills. Um, and so we are awaiting sort of final decisions about uh, Article 6. But we are slated to lose roughly uh, $59 million uh, that would uh, provide, that do provide funding for critical public health services. And so those are cuts that uh, we cannot afford to sustain. Is that, that's on top of a PEG? Correct. Okay, and what portion of the PEG exactly uh, will be assigned to the Division of Mental Hygiene? So for fiscal year, uh, this fiscal year, our PEG is $10 million, and for next fiscal year, it's $5 million. There are conversations that are ongoing with OMB, and you know my uh, intent and our intent is to ensure that direct services to New Yorkers are not impacted. Are there any programs that are, that are gonna be specifically targeted? So for right now, we're looking at everything, and the intent is, again, to make, make sure that direct services to New Yorkers are not affected, and my hope is that uh, by April, we'll be able to give more detail about which programs or which uh, areas we will be looking to to absorb those pegs. Do you feel that in the current budget, we have enough money uh, for supportive housing fund, we have enough supportive housing funding for mentally ill, developmentally disabled, or physically disabled? So as health commissioner, I'm always, always happy to money. take more money. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I win the lotto, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think that the point here is that we um, work to maximize the services that come with those units and ensure that we keep individuals in their communities thriving and contributing to the to the fabric of the city. And Has there been an increase in the budget at all for that for that specific uh, target group? So the mayor under uh, New York 1515 has uh, contributed uh, a fair amount of dollars, uh, fifteen thousand uh, supportive housing units. 15K. Okay. Do you feel that there's enough access to mental health services for the LGBT youth and adults in all five boroughs? I'm sorry, can you ask again? Do you feel that there's enough access to mental health services for the LGBT youth and adults in all five boroughs? We are, as a city, focused on ensuring that we maximize access to all New Yorkers, but certainly we recognize that for LGBTQ youth, um, there are uh, unique challenges. And so we, through um, the Unity Project and through the LGBTQ Roadmap, have been working with uh, community-based organizations to make sure that um, these organizations are fully leveraging access to NYC Well, that we're maximizing access to mental health first aid. Are those organizations being funded to do this? So um, as with other organizations throughout the city is really raising awareness because taking the course is free. Okay. I think. 
that is it. Did you have any other questions? No. I think so that's it. We've run out of council members, and we run out of time, and we have <laughs> we have six panels um, waiting. Uh, thank you so much for coming to testify. It's always a pleasure, and thank you for sitting through Thrive. Um, I think that was very informative and, and very helpful. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership in this. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, the first panel is Man Yu Juk, Juk Yu, Joe Park, Juhan, Marie Bazu, Faith Bayum. Okay, we can start. Are we missing anyone? There were five people on the floor. Yu. okay. Joe Park, Ju Han. No, Ju Han. What did I say? I'm Ju. Uh -huh. Marie, is Marie here? No. Faith, okay, thank you. You can start. You want to start this way? Sure. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Diana Ayala and the Committee on Mental Health, with Disabilities and Addiction for coming to this hearing today. Good to see you all. Um, I'm Ju Han, I'm the Deputy Director at the Asian American Federation. Our mission is to raise the influence and well-being of the pan-Asian American community through research, policy advocacy, public awareness, and organizational development. We represent a network of 70 member agencies working in the areas of health and human services, education, economic development, civic participation, and social justice. Uh, we're, I wanted to also thank uh, Council Member Van Bremer for recognizing um, AF's advocacy work in the, in the previous hearing. Um, you know, we wanted to mention that we are scheduled to meet with Thrive, but the fact still stands that there has been limited interaction between Thrive and the Pan-Asian community, especially with agencies that uh, provide mental health services like those represented here today. And we're here today to highlight the mental health, uh, the vis increasingly visible mental health needs of Asian New Yorkers, who are the only racial group for which suicide was consistently one of the top 10 leading causes of death from 1997 to 2015. And it was one of the top three leading causes of death for Asian Americans ages 10 to 34. And despite these alarming statistics, there's been virtually no investment in citywide mental health services tailored for the Pan-Asian community by the city. The rate of investment has not changed since the launch of Thrive NYC. We've spoken with and highlighted in our report that based on our research, there's no, uh, the top-down approach that Thrive takes to provide mental health services does not work for the Asian community. For example, New York City Well, one of the initiatives that they um, tout frequently, uh, hinder is, is uh, 
is difficult for our community to access because of the 70 percent uh, limited, English, in, limited English proficiency rate in our community, as well as the deep cultural stigma. Um, the community is now under greater threat. According to a February 2019 report by the Comptroller's Office, Asian immigrants are being disproportionately targeted for harsh immigration enforcement. Even though immigrants from China, Bangladesh, and India combined represent less than 20% of non-citizens in New York City, they comprise 40% of all defendants facing immigration detention and removal. Individuals and families who undergo these situations experience extreme stress, anxiety, and trauma, but have little to no access to, in language, culturally appropriate mental health services. The needs are only growing. Asians are the fastest growing racial um, and ethnic group in New York City. The population grew by 50% between 2000 and 2016, and of this, 25% Asians live in poverty, a rate that grew by 45, 44%. And studies have shown that there's a strong correlation between poverty and mental disorders. And this combined with deep stigma and the stress of living in a xenophobic climate puts Asians at particular risk for mental health issues. Our 2017 report on overcoming challenges to mental health services for Asian New Yorkers identified the major challenges to accessing mental health services for the, for the Asian community. Our overarching recommendation was, that, was this, addressing mental health challenges in the pan-Asian community requires significant increased support for Asian-led Asian-serving organizations working to provide in-language, culturally competent mental health services. They need funding to create community education programs to reduce the deep cultural stigma, to hire linguistically and culturally appropriate providers, and to sustain programs that integrate mental health services into other social services. <laughs> Nonetheless, the community has received only 0.2% of total service dollars from uh, DOHMH from fiscal year 2002 to 2014. We asked the council to, invest, to address a chronic underfunding of Asian nonprofits and make an initial investment of $1 million in pan-Asian nonprofit organizations to develop community-wide capacity in mental health services. Asian-led agencies providing services directly to Asians are in the best position to use funding most effectively. This investment would support the following services. Develop a training program for Asian-led organizations using models of non-clinical service delivery that utilize existing services and programs. Create a network of non-clinical mental health service providers serving Asian communities to share resources and knowledge about best practices. Provide cultural competency training for mainstream mental health service providers, as well as develop a database of shared mental health service providers. AAF plans to launch a program in partnership with our members to help reduce barriers to mental health services for Asian New Yorkers this year. We look forward to working with the city to address the mental health services, service needs of Asian New Yorkers. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Diana Ayala and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for convening this hearing today. My name is Joe Park, and I'm the Clinic Director at KCS Mental Health Services. KCS Mental Health Clinic is the first New York State licensed outpatient mental health clinic operated by a Korean nonprofit organization. Our licensed professionals have been providing culturally and linguistically competent mental health services since November 2015. And since that time, we've provided more than 9,000 services and served nearly 600 clients. According to our part-time nurse practitioner who also works at a local hospital, there's been a decrease in ER hospitalizations of Korean patients since KCS Mental Health Clinic opened our doors in 2015. For most of our older clients with severe mental illnesses, KCS Mental Health Clinic is their only option as we provide in-language psychotherapy and medication management services and accept clients regardless of their ability to pay for services. There's a great need for mental health services in the Korean community. Based on the Asian American Federation's 2019 ethnic profile of the community, nearly 19% of the 100,000 Koreans in New York live in poverty, with particularly high rates of poverty, nearly 26% among Korean seniors. Due to 70% 70 per, 70 being foreign-born, 50% of Korean New Yorkers have limited English proficiency, which means that their ability to access services in English is severely limited. Again, according to the Asian American Federation's report, Asian Americans are the least likely group to support, receive and seek uh, medical help for depressive symptoms due to lack of knowledge, stigma, and insurance limits. One of the biggest challenges that we're experiencing right now at the clinic is recruiting and retaining talent with cultural and linguistic skills. Korean Community Services is a small community-based organization and we're not able to compete with the competitive salaries of hospitals, larger organizations, and thrive. We're already struggling to recruit talent with the cultural and linguistic skills in a limited pool, and we simply cannot afford to lose any more staff. 
in the previous hearing, uh, Director Herman had mentioned that uh, they do provide mental health first aid trainings in Korean, and um, this was actually news to us because we have a clinician who took the training in English, translated everything to Korean, and is providing these trainings on Saturdays during our busiest days. Mm. So um, we would welcome the opportunity to collaborate with Thrive to help address the challenges that our community is facing around the growing need for mental health services and how to build capacity and create sustainable solutions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. So I, I think that Susan said that it was on request. Um, is, are, you, are, you, are you both, are you all scheduled to meet with Thrive soon? Who's meeting with Thrive? Federation. The Federation? Yeah, I, I, I would ask about that, but um, I'm gonna follow up on that, on, on that uh, concern because she, she did say that it was by request, but I wonder how many people are actually requesting it, if people know that they have to request it prior to, thank, I, I'll, I'll look into that. And okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Man Yak Yu. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services. I'm here today to thank a New York City Council Committee on Mental Health, um, Chair Diana, uh, Diana Neala, and Council Speaker Corey Johnson for the continuous support of um, the Immigrant Health Initiative as well as various health and mental health initiatives across the city, which has enabled organizations like ours to offer critical mental health services to our vulnerable immigrant populations. I want to urge the City Council to expand our exciting work by increasing initiative funding for the Immigrant Health Initiative and Mental Health Services for Vulnerable, for vulnerable Populations, so community-based organizations that are offering this culturally competent work on the ground. Um, the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services, or AMPS, is a not-for-profit healthcare organization, Sunset Park, that provides free clinical screenings integrated with individualized health, education, and social services to uninsured immigrant populations in New York City. Our mission is to deinstitutionalize healthcare and make it a basic human right for all New Yorkers. We provide free health access services um, without discrimination of documentation or socioeconomic status, serving over 1,000 people, uh, 1,000 people per year. Um, Sunset Park houses nearly 130,000 residents, um, of which 44% are Latino, um, about a third who are Chinese, uh, with the exploding population of uh, Chinese immigrants in the community. Um, Sunset Park is also home to one of New York City's highest concentration of documented immigrants and unaccompanied minors, a group that suffers high risk of chronic infectious and behavioral health issues due to lack of healthcare access. Over the past years, federal immigration threats, hate crimes, migratory post-traumatic stress, and assimilative stress have increased anxieties among immigrant communities, making health, mental health risk factors for this population more prevalent than ever. These mental health illnesses, when left unintended, place them at a risk for socialization barriers, severed, severed relationships, and physical comorbidities. Furthermore, New York State Child Health Plus offers health insurance to youth ages 18 and under, regardless of immigration status, but youth exceeding this upper age limit are often left without health care access unless they apply for health insurance to the marketplace, their employer, parents' or employer, or college. Undocumented youth and families without worker authorization fall through these health care gaps. And while recipients of uh, DACA and temporary protected status are eligible for work authorization and Medicaid, threats to rescind DACA and terminate TPS programs will also disenfranchise more members of this community from accessing health care, increasing the pool of uninsured individuals, leading to an unprecedented increase of immigrants seeking health care services through CBOs like ours. Without health insurance, undocumented immigrants are unable to access critically needed behavioral health treatments. Emergency and charity care do not cover mental health services for the uninsured. City initiatives offer school-based counseling to youth under 18, and wellness hotlines like Thrive NYC may only be able to connect community members to institutions where many, where many lack language-competent workers and socialization programs to serve this vulnerable population to serve this vulnerable population. Additionally, many community members are uncomfortable going through third-party interpreters for topics as sensitive as mental health. Youth, in particular, may feel embarrassed or hesitant to express their feelings, especially when facing a therapist that does not speak their language. Many of, um, additionally, our system also does not make mental health care mainstream or affordable, averaging 90 dollars a visit even for low income sliding scale patients who try to access um, who try to access these services through um, through the public hospital system. 
Over the past two years, the organization has received immigrant health initiative funding that has helped us offer expanded health, uh, health services, including preventative health screenings, nutrition counseling, and social assistance for community members seeking services free of charge. It also enabled us to offer free bilingual Spanish, English, mental health counseling to undocumented, uninsured, and underinsured community members, often lasting 10 or more weeks on Saturdays, a service with an ongoing extensive wait list that may take anywhere from two to three months. In, um, in the upcoming fiscal year, we are aiming to expand our services to the Chinese-speaking population. Um, especially with the fact that bilingual services in uninsured Chinese uh, immigrant populations is often very much stigmatized and ignored. Socialization services are often uh, offered to this population for individuals that are already seeking psychiatric treatment only, which means that they have to be insured. Um, we are also hoping to offer music and group therapy for this population in the upcoming year. And we know that we need to urgently connect immigrants to the appropriate and equitable care and empower them with resources to seek their rights and tear down the emotional barriers they are facing. Currently, there is a dearth of funding for culturally competent services across community-based organizations that are already doing this work. With the funding provided, we are only able to manage an ongoing caseload of approximately 60 cases per year. We need to double the support from previous years to match the increased demand seen in our growing immigrant communities, as well as the demand from immigrants who will fall out of coverage due to federal policies affecting their status. Furthermore, we need more coordination with New York City Thrive NYC program to ensure that culturally competent mental health services, service CBOs, are included as a referral site for coordinated care. I humbly thank the City Council for funding both the Immigrant Health Initiative and um, other mental health initiatives um, through, speakers, through the speakers programs and initiatives and strongly urge that the Council expand initiative funding for immigrant and mental health services community-based organizations like AMPS working on providing on-the-ground, culturally competent uh, mental health programs. We look forward to working together to ensure that healthcare is not a privilege, but a basic human right. Thank you. I'm going to ask that we try to stick to the two-minute rule. We have over 18 people that are waiting. And it, so if you can summarize a copy of the full testimony, you know, will be entered um, into the record. Um, we just don't have enough time. And I, I just want to thank you for coming uh, to testify. I know that this has been an issue that we've also been kind of hammering away at here at the council. We're trying to, you know, work on a solution um, that better addresses uh, your needs and, and your funding needs. And so I look forward to hearing more about uh, any progress uh, with the Thrive, uh, not agency, the, the Thrive office, um, and any, any, anything new that arises from it. Thank you. Good afternoon, Good Chairperson afternoon. Ayala. My name is Faith Bayam. I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Uh, before I get into our budget request pertaining to mental health initiatives, I would just like to stress the need for continued support of the human services sector. UJA is grateful to the City Council for their support of our fiscal 2019 request to encourage system-wide contract review and allow providers to adjust contracts to support cost escalators for rent, insurance, supplies, and utilities, and appropriately account for fringe benefits over the life of the contract. We hope you will continue to support us in our request for fiscal year 20, including 250 million to fully fund the Health and Human Services Cost Policies and Procedures Manual, and standing with the sector to reject any cuts to human services funding. Uh, our nonprofit partners receive funding through a number of mental health initiatives, including autism awareness, geriatric mental health, children under five, and court-involved youth mental health. We are requesting an increase in funding for the autism awareness initiative by 800,000 for a total of 4 million in fiscal year 20. Seven of our nonprofit partners receive funding through the autism awareness initiative. This initiative funding allows our nonprofit partners to provide wraparound services to autistic children and youth in after school and summer programs. The wraparound after school and summer programs provided by our nonprofit partners generally focus on assisting participants develop intellectually and socially. Many, many of these programs are located in community centers that promote the inclusion of people with autism and other disability in all their classes and events. These inclusive environments ensure individuals with autism make connections with each other as well as the broader communities in which they live. Creating inclusive environments can be costly for providers. 
but funds from the Autism Awareness Initiative help providers to create inclusive environments by funding additional support staff or technology to support the assistance individuals with autism need to attend programs. Um, thank you for the continued support of this initiative, and just very quickly, I would like to ask for support of the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative for a total of 2.5 million, um, Children Under Five Initiative for two million, and the Court Involved Youth Mental Health Initiative for a total of 3.25 million. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, my name is Joy Long Pasai. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of Hamilton Madison House for the Behavioral Health Program. We are a nonprofit settlement house located in the Lower East Side. We are the largest outpatient behavioral health provider for the Asian Americans on the East Coast. Currently, we operate five mental health clinics, a personalized recovery-oriented service program, and a supportive housing program for individuals with severe mental illness. We are located in two locations, both in Manhattan and Queens. Our staff are bilingual, and we provide services in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Cambodian. In the last decade, Asian Americans continue to be one of the largest and fastest growing population in the New York metropolitan area. We at Hamilton Madison House have worked tirelessly to increase the capacity to serve this underserved population through active education, preventative projects, and providing culturally specific services. In New York City, there are only a few psychiatric units in the public hospitals and fewer than a dozen mental health clinics that provide linguistically, ser linguistically services to meet the needs of the growing Asian community. In a recent study on suicide attempters among Chinese Americans, local PCPs were the most common providers in which the suicide attempters sought consultations for their mental health, and yet most of the providers failed to provide psychoeducation or referral services to mental health. Asians are often the most difficult to engage in services due to stigma associated with help, seeking help and lacking cultural competent providers. Many admit to having thoughts of suicide or attempts pass, attempted pass, attempted suicide in the past. This is a crisis that cannot be ignored. <clears throat> Currently in Hamilton Madison House, mental health pro programs, 20% of our client population have severe symptoms with high risk um, factors, many with passive eye suicide ideations and often require psychiatric intervention. Currently, due to the lack of clinicians and the financial resources to fund positions, we are wait on a waiting list for patients to be seen. Our wait list is an average of three to four weeks to be seen by a treating prescriber or a clinician. <clears throat> we have not been funded by any New York City Thrive Initiative or have not been consulted regarding the mental health needs of the Asian American community. Providing vital um, services for underserved populations, Hamilton Madison is, is often looked upon for safety net uh, for the Asian American community. We strongly urge the New York City Committee for Mental Health Disabilities and Addictions to address this issue and to allocate appropriate funding to Asian American organizations that provide services to a growing yet underserved and overlooked population. Thank you. Joy, have you requested a meeting with the Thrive team? Yes, we have, but we have not had an opportunity to meet with them. Okay. They did not show up for their meeting, so. Okay. We, we'll see about maybe, maybe we can facilitate a meeting and invite everyone. Maybe we can have a, a round table or something. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The next panel is Donna Tilgman, Alice Burke, uh, Burn, Burke, Burke? Sorry about that. Salma Malik and Sarita Dathery. Good afternoon. You want to start? Remember to summarize. <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Salma Malik, and I'm the founder of K2, Climb to Autism Services. Um, we're seeking to provide autism services to children and their parents 
who are underprivileged and underserved, specifically um, those who speak languages that are really not covered by most other agencies. Mostly they're only covering Spanish and maybe Chinese, so I'm providing services in Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, and Bengali, um, and I'm also trying to reach uh, other languages, but these are gonna be based on the parents that are coming in, and um, I'm hope hopefully be able to get people to help me. So I'm an occupational therapist, and right now it's all volunteer-based what I'm doing. I have other OTs, I have educators, I have um, speech therapists who are all just volunteering on my team. So right now I'm just doing work in, out of community centers, and um, I've reached out to some of the council members' offices, and I'm applying for discretionary funding for this year, and I'm just hoping that I can be able to expand my services so that I'm doing more than just parent counseling and workshops, which happen not so often. I want to make it a more regular thing, and I want to be able to provide some more services to kids so they have activities to do on like weekly or monthly basis, because there's definitely a need, and when parents don't understand the language, they don't know how to access services that are already out there. They also you know, want someone familiar who understands their culture and everything. So I just um, want to thank you for the opportunity for letting me speak today and hope that you guys can reach out to me. I look forward to working with you. <coughs> Salma, is, is, are these services being uh, offered citywide? Or are yes, you I'm trying to role? offer the services citywide, but right now it's based on languages of you know, the people who are on my team already. So mostly I'm trying to do in, in Brooklyn and Queens, but I would be open to going anywhere um, that these services are needed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Bufkin. I'm the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health with Citizens Committee for Children of New York. CCC is a nonprofit child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Thank you, Chair Ayala, for holding today's uh, very important hearing. Um, my written testimony includes additional recommendations and more details, but today I'll focus on a few of our priorities uh, for the sake of time. Um, I think the conversation today has made clear how important it is uh, for our city to map out what the resources are available to children uh, with mental health needs um, to determine how they can best coordinate and to determine where the gaps are remaining. Um, one aspect of this larger behavioral health landscape is the current statewide transition of children's behavioral health services into Medicaid managed care. Um, this includes important changes like aligning home and community-based services and adding a new array of children and family treatment and support services. Um, we urge the City Council and the administration to work with DOE, DOHMH, and other child-serving agencies um, to assist with this, make sure we have a, a supportive transition uh, as this is coming on board at the state level and ultimately help better connect children and families with services. Um, CCC is enormously grateful to the City Council for your ongoing commitment to supporting mental health initiatives that help meet the needs of children and families. For years, uh, these uh, mental health initiatives have used non-traditional community-based settings to help identify children and families in need and offer developmentally appropriate services and supports. We join other advocates in urging that these City Council initiatives be restored, as well as supporting additional investments in key programs. I have some additional details on the, um, the funding requests and written uh, testimony. Um, these initiatives include the Mental Health Services for Children Under Five initiative. Uh, children Under Five has provided screening and psychotherapy to thousands of families, as well as mental health consultation services to numerous pediatricians, preschool teachers, and child welfare workers. With additional funding, providers will be able to strengthen referrals, increase training on trauma-informed care, and expand programs to new community partners. We also support uh, strongly the court-involved youth initiative. Um, more funding is needed to enable additional trainings for organizations working with court-involved youth who have experienced trauma, increase ref uh, to help increase referrals between programs, and improve therapies for youth. Um, and I will include this, my written testimony includes some additional recommendations related to school-based uh, behavioral health. We strongly support additional, 150 additional social workers in schools. We support restorative practices, and we support uh, the mental health continuum, which is something that had been um, developed by the mayor's uh, uh, committee on school climate. Um, again, thanks very much for holding this uh, hearing today. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction Committee Chairwoman Diana Ayala and distinguished members of the committee. It is the honor of Local 372 New York City Board of Education Employees District Council 37 asked me to present the testimony on behalf of the approximately 300 substance abuse prevention and prevention specialists, otherwise known as SAPIS, um, that we represent under the leadership of President Sean D. Francois I. And my name is Donna Tillman, and I am the SAPIS. Um, the SAPIS chapter secretary. Um, 
on the executive board of Local D72. Um, last year I came with my um, colleague, Mr. Kevin Allen. He sends his hellos. He wasn't able to be here because he's had surgery, but he is here in spirit. So um, SAPIS provides um, prevention and intervention services for the students of the New York City public school system. Though we only have 300 SAPIS and we are not in every school, our goal is to be in every school. Um, how we are able to reach many students is some SAPIS are also on crisis intervention teams. So therefore, if there's a crisis in another school, a SAPIS is sent to another school with a team to provide counseling service, emergency services um, for our students. Um, um, we service students K to 12, and we service all students. No student is turned away. Um, we do pre mostly prevention services, whereas we go into the classrooms and we do classroom presentations. Um, we have um, science-based um, curriculum uh, um, where we teach the students, and we have um, different, different curricula for the students, and they're all age-appropriate uh, curricula. Um, where we, we teach students um, things, uh, so we start off with teaching them about self-esteem, um, dealing with decision making, how to be assertive when you find yourself in situations, how to communicate. Um, also, we offer our students counseling service, um, at-risk counseling, individual service um, counseling, um, group counseling. We also offer our students positive alternatives, so we'll have groups whereas we would include our students um, you know, in music or photography, we offer writing skills and, and things of that nature. And I know that my time is up, but I would like to finish briefly. Our goal is to help students become healthy, positive, functioning, prosperous contributors to our society. We want our students to discover their purpose and to live their best lives. Thank you. Is there a funding request? Yes, oh, I'm sorry, yes, we are, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's the important part. We are, it's, we did, we did give you our testimony, but um, yes, we are requesting um, funding, we are requesting funding for our students. We've had um, some SAPIS laid off over the, over the past um, few years. We would like to see a SAPIS in every school, so we're asking for an increase in funding to have a SAPIS in, in, every, in every school. Um, in here in our testimony, it tells you the cost. It costs approximately 71723 um, for SAPIS, which part of that is salary, the other part are, 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 are benefits. Um, to hire the SAPIS. And, and just so that you know that most of our SAPIS do live within the five boroughs, so our students still see us in the supermarket, at the laundromat, church, everywhere. So we are in the community, um, and, our, stu and, and we have, our students have access to us. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Councilmember Ayala. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today um, and for your leadership on this issue. I'm an organizer with Just Leadership USA. We, you know us uh, for our work on the Close Rikers campaign, and I'm actually here today to talk about divesting from law enforcement as a way to create safety and instead investing in the types of community resources like mental health resources that can create safety by strengthening and stabilizing communities. So um, I sh shared with all of you a, a copy of our Build Communities platform that we developed over um, this course of a couple of months through a participatory process with partners and residents. Um, and I just want to highlight in particular the supportive housing element of it. I know that that was a question that sort of came up in terms of um, the how sufficient the resources are in the city right now. So we know that there is a 1515 supportive housing initiative, but to the best of our knowledge, um, the city is investing in that at a rate of developing about 750 units per year. We want to see that accelerated to more like 1500 units per year. Um, we know that the city is funding about 100 something uh, justice involved supportive housing units. We want to see that increase to 1000. Um, and that's based on the research that was done that indicated the need for that. Um, the housing units as they exist right now, the justice involved supportive housing units are useful because they're not subject to the homelessness chronicity requirement that the HUD funded units are. Um, but they're, they haven't been as effective as they could be because they're mostly voucher based and the vouchers are not, um, the uh, voucher amounts are not sufficient to meet the market demands. And so those need to either be voucher levels increased or it needs to be cluster site housing rather than scatter site. 
um, and two other recommendations that came up within supportive housing were that um, all supportive housing be developed through a housing first approach to quickly connect individuals and families um, with housing without preconditions like um, without sobriety or you know even um, uh, adherence to a medical re you know medication regime as a, as a precondition for housing um, but stabilizing people in stable housing first um, and also, Allocating increased funding to expand training for staff to use harm reduction, trauma-informed, and motivational interviewing approaches in supportive housing residences so that providers do not screen out higher need individuals um, in the interview stage and increase oversight of the interview and screening process for supportive housing clients so that we minimize the number of people who are screened out of supportive housing and then we know end up in our um, in our jails and prisons. Um, so I'll stop there. We, uh, we know that this committee would like to fund all of that. Um, we know that there are other areas, particularly law enforcement, um, NYPD, and even the DOC operations budget, which hasn't dropped as the jail population has dropped, um, are areas where we see those resources available. Thank, Thank you. you. Bob, do you have any questions? No? Thank you. Our next panel is Ke uh, Kelly Grace Priya, Gerard Bryant, Catherine Warmfeld, Joe uh, DiGenova. Kelly, we'll start with you. Okay, great. Thank you, Councilwoman. I'm Kelly Grace Price. I'm co-founder of the Close Rosies organization. And I'm here with a couple different comments. Um, wearing two hats, the first as a freelance radio journalist. In May of 2017, the organization that I work for, WBAI News, sent a request to City Hall asking for specifics about the Thrive program. Still almost two years later, we have not received a response from anyone in the press office. I forwarded that to you, Councilwoman Ayala, just so that you knew. And then I also forwarded you uh, my testimony. And Councilman Holden, I beg your pardon, I didn't send it to you, but I will forward it to you. Um, and if you wouldn't mind giving me your, your committee council's contacts, I'll send it to you so that it gets into the file. Um, I thank you for holding this hearing, <clears throat> and I want to appear today to submit comment on my own personal experience as a person with a severe mental health diagnosis and the way that we're treated via the Thrive program. Uh, I'm a survivor of the terrorist attacks on the city. My office was on the 21st floor of Tower 2. I escaped that day. Um, but uh, the miasma of mental health that I have experienced as a woman has led me to Rikers Island as a survivor of trauma, of domestic violence. I ended up on Rikers Island <clears throat> accused of crimes that I did not commit. It's a long story, I, I won't bore you with it. But very often survivors of um, trafficking, sexual violence in DV end up on Rikers Island. Um, and we're forever marked as someone, if we've even had one sort of EDP light incident, we're forever marked in the NYPD databases as someone um, who is an EDP, and every single time we have a police interaction, those interactions very clearly go south because the police and the CIT teams address us as someone that needs qualifications. Um, I wrote extensively and I turned in my testimony about an incident that happened when I called the 34th precinct. I live in Washington Heights. Um, is my time up already? Was that my whole three minutes? So I beg your pardon, I did submit testimony about it. Um, and there's no oversight. Once you're demarcated as a person with the severe mental health diagnosis, even if you're not showing signs, even if you're not triggered, because the, the NYPD already knows that that is associated with you, you go straight to the um, emergency room. I'm still stuck with a $1,700 bill that my Medicaid refuses to pay at Columbia Presbyterian and I keep getting collections on it. Um, I've turned in all my testimony and the bills is attached. 
Susan Herman knows about this particular problem. I'm a member of the Downstate Coalition Against Sexual Violence, and I, when Susan came last year to pitch her new Thrive program, <clears throat> they were beginning on their second phase at about this time last year, I mentioned that this was a problem, and Susan asked me to email her about it, and I did. Uh, the CCRB was investigating. The particular officer was given a, a, a substantiated, the case went to administrative trial, and then she was exonerated. So, and <clears throat> someone like me, what happens for the rest of my life? The next time someone lays their hands on me, the next time I'm in a position, I'm not going to call the police for help because I'll get sent straight to the emergency room. Thank you for listening to me, and I hope that you read my testimony closely. I will. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jody Genova. Good afternoon. I'm the Associate Executive Director of CUCS, and I'm here because CUCS is one of the first organizations to operate intensive mobile treatment teams, which are Thrive programs. We help develop the model. We have two teams. We're well prepared for this. We've helped people, our mission is to help people rise from property, escape homelessness, and be well. We're in charge of all the street outreach in Manhattan. We've helped 4,300 people get off the streets since 2007. We operate shelters for mentally ill homeless people, provide services in 2,300 units of supportive housing, have psychiatrists and primary care providers working in 70 locations to serve mentally ill um, homeless and formerly homeless people. Intensive mobile treatment is a multidisciplinary team that works with 27 people at a time at most. We're especially proud of two of our accomplishments, which is helping 27 people that have been referred to us exit homelessness, helping 40 people get the psychiatric care that they need, I'd like to tell you about one case which I think is representative of, the, of our work. When we first met Mrs. R, she had been in the shelter system for over 20 years, struggling to get her life together. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia and epilepsy, and she had a very explosive way about her. She was frequently transferred from one shelter to the other after altercations with clients or staff. Because she attributed all of her symptoms to her seizure disorder, she refused treatment for her mental illness, and because her mental illness contributed to her explosiveness, and her shelter transfers, it was hard for her to get her seizure disorder under control. Many times during the 20 years in the shelter, she was hospitalized, received summonses for disorderly conduct and assault, and became separated from the people who were charged with helping her. Today, I'm happy to say that Mrs. R is living in supportive housing, taking anti-seizure anti and anti-psychotic medication, not behaving in an explosive manner, and reconnecting with families her family. Our IMT team was successful with her because they can follow her wherever she goes and because they have the time, flexibility, and expertise to engage her in a productive working relationship. At first, the team spent countless hours working with her to get a full neurological workup, get the optimal seizure medication. Because they acknowledged her concern with the seizure medication, she was open to their um, suggestion that she do something about her schizophrenia. She soon took an antipsychotic medication by injection. And that's what put her on her path to a different um, life. The IMT teams work with individuals who have experienced trauma, other mental illnesses, oppression, incarceration, estrangement from family and friends, and repeated separations from helping professionals. As a result, many have become aggressive, carry weapons, experience paranoia, struggle with alcohol and other substances, and have trouble connecting with the mainstream service system. The IMT model addresses that by giving staff the time, the flexibility, and the resources to engage, follow, and work with people to recover from these challenges and to improve their lives. Thank you for holding this hearing, giving me the opportunity to tell you about the program. How long does it usually take to engage an individual that you come across through the mobile treatment teams? Like, is it one attempt? 17 attempts, what, what does that look like? Depends on the person and the engagement's a gradual process, so there's gotta be some minimal engagement right from the beginning because otherwise the person won't interact with you. But we are persistent. Once the person's, a, these are the, the, a lot of these people programs almost happy to see them go because they don't have the resources to work with them. Once they're referred to us, they're ours. So we have to figure out how to engage with them. So I would say over the course of a few weeks, we're pretty, pretty much successful with most people. Um, thanks for your testimony. Do, do you have trouble keep hiring and keeping mental health uh, professionals in, you know, in, as a provider? We're getting a lot of complaints. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's, it's national at this point, but what about, have you experienced that? We, I just was looking at turnover data. Our turnover data is around 20% a year for all 
titles, it's higher at the low at the case manager level. It's, it goes up to 25, 28, 30. This particular program, we don't have the same kind of trouble. We pay a, uh, we pay a bonus on top of the regular salary to work in this program because it's very tough. And the, the people who are working here are, they're seeing real progress in people f with whom nothing else had been working. And I think they get a sense of satisfaction out of that that keeps them, keeps them in the job. But you know, probably four or five or six years is the average length of tenure we're gonna see in this kind of program. And, and th so Thrive is, you're getting, are you getting paid um, you know, on a timely basis? Um, now. Now. Now, yeah, it took a long time to get the contracts registered. Time. And do you think that's because of Thrive? No, I think the contracting process in the city it isn't efficient. It doesn't move quickly enough. So we operated one of the programs for a full year before we saw any money. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, City Council Committee Chair and members and honored guests. I'm Dr. Gerard Bryant, Director of Counseling at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, one of 25 colleges, schools actually one of 11 senior colleges within the city, University of New York system, and Hispanic serving, minority serving institution. As a core of Thrive program, otherwise known as a site champion, one of 10 site champions in the CUNY system, and a partner of the Mental Health Service Corps, henceforth referred to as MHSC, I'm here today to share our experience with this initiative. We have been a site champion since the very beginning of the initiative back in July 2016. John Jay College has been fortunate to have the services at various times of a total of seven MHSC early career professionals in our Counseling Services Center, which is embedded in our Wellness Center. They have worked a combined total of 110 months, which is nearly nine years of collective service in our program. During this period of two years and nine months, MHSC early career professionals have amassed a total of over five 1,500 clinical hours. As part of those direct service hours, MHSC professionals have conducted a total of 147 intakes, provided more than 178 hours of crisis intervention to 164 students, and provided nearly 3,000 sessions, hours of personal counseling to 237 students. Our MHSC providers have also led groups for our LBGT community and groups focusing on trauma-informed care. In addition, MHSC staff have provided hundreds of hours of non-direct clinical services, such as consultation to faculty and staff on student-related matters, conducted workshops and tabling on mental health issues facing college students, and collaborated with mental health professionals on and off campus. Because of their services, I know that many of our students have been able to overcome significant emotional and psychological challenges and graduate as a result of the services of mental health service corps professionals. At a time where college counseling centers are seeing more students coming forward with significant mental health issues like depression, anxiety, stress, and substance abuse, we would not be able to provide this extent of mental health services to a population of nearly 13,000 undergraduate and 2,000 graduate students without the support of this program. Numbers, however, tell only part of the story. These early career professionals came to us with impressive academic credentials, solid training, and enthusiasm to work with our population. In conclusion, MHSC clinicians have increased the, have increased the capacity of our Counseling Services Center, and I look forward to a continued partnership with NYC Thrive MHCSC program as we continue to provide much needed mental health services to our traditional and non-traditional college population many of whom represent underserved communities in this city. Thank you for your time and consideration and for this opportunity. Good, good afternoon, uh, Chair Ayala and esteemed members of City Council. My name is Kate Wormfeld and I'm the Director of Family Court Programs at the Center for Court Innovation and I'm joined here by Shane Karaya, who's the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Center. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here to request the Council to support the Center uh, as it seeks to renew and strengthen the work we do with over 75,000 New Yorkers annually. Many of these individuals are children and young people in early diversion and alternatives to incarceration programs who may be receiving mental health support. 
Our programs have been shown to be effective. Our city council funded work has provided individuals with meaningful off ramps from a cycle of poverty and recidivism to real integration back into their communities. To continue to accomplish this work, we seek continuation funding for our core citywide speaker request, um, our youth-focused supervised release programming that divert defendants from lengthy and costly pretrial detention, and our pre-court diversion project reset programming. We also request that council expand funding available under the mental health initiatives for vulnerable populations and uh, for court-involved youth. We have submitted several applications to permit us to increase mental health access in the outer boroughs where demand outstrips our current capacity. Through council support, we could provide enhanced mental health services and community interventions to at-risk youth and their families. For example, our Strong Starts Court Initiative provides court-based clinical assessments and tailored more frequent clinical and judicial oversight for more efficient and effective case process, which includes evidence-based mental health interventions to infants and their parents and caregivers so that children can remain safely in a stable home while under ACS and court supervision and reduce the effects of trauma and recurrence of maltreatment. Um, but currently, demand outstrips capacity for this program. We only have four Strong Starts social workers citywide, and there are over 3,000 qualified neglect petitions filed annually. In the Bronx, the borough with the highest rate of violent crime um, in the city, we're seeking to expand the number of child crime victim survivors we can serve through child trauma support program. These children receive ongoing therapy following their victimization from violent crimes such as sexual and physical abuse and domestic violence. A summary of our applications has been submitted with our testimony. What is the current caseload per worker? Um, currently, each each worker handles 20 children um, at a time, um, but their caseload involves much more than just serving those children because there are up to 20 to 40 collateral contacts with that children, with, with all of those children, and then also um, through all of our consultations and uh, trainings and that we do with judges and the legal community, we're able to sort of leverage our expertise throughout the court system, but 20 children is the recommended caseload based on the zero to three national model, which is the Safe Babies Court Teams, uh, which is what the program is based on. Do you, do you keep a wait list or do you refer individuals that you're not able to see immediately to other community-based organizations? We don't keep a wait list, per se, because the way the cases are identified is through the judge that presides over the Strong Starts cases. So they identify the cases sort of most in need for our services and that are most the most complex cases, and we take those cases. So the judge kind of keeps an ongoing the list in that way. But we're able to help not cases that aren't don't qualify for Strong Starts. We're able to help in those other ways I mentioned by providing consultations to the practitioners and by holding um, steering committee meetings where we invite all of the community-based providers to the court so that the court is aware of all of these interventions and can, uh, and can utilize those for cases that don't qualify for the program. Perfect. Thank you. Ms. Pierre. Uh, and as an addendum is from the same organization, Shane Cry, Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships. Uh, Kate covered the programming that we offer in family court, and I'd also like to just highlight the work that we do in the criminal justice system. Uh, with Rikers closing, the need for competent, coherent mental health services offered in community uh, is going to be incredibly important to ensure public safety. And we, in addition to offering those services, uh, continue to work uh, directly with providers as well as the defendants who are diverted from the Rikers population. Uh, a summary of those applications are included within our testimony uh, that goes into the mental health work that we do throughout New York City. Thank you for your consideration. I saw those. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel is Amy Doran, Harriet Lessel, Kendra Oak, Chris Norwood, and DJ Jaffe.
whenever you're ready. I thank you for having these hearings and the other panelists for letting me go first. Um, I was very disappointed today, like Shirlane McRae, I have a mentally ill family member, a seriously mentally ill family member, and we all heard her mention anxiety and depression numerous times. I never heard her mention schizophrenia or psychosis, and we need an all-hands-on-deck approach to treating the most seriously mentally ill. The fact that she couldn't, didn't even know that there's a way to count the mentally ill. There's 239,000 seriously mentally ill in New York City, 93,000 go untreated. I don't have much time, so I'm just gonna go through the charts that are in my handout. I am not a mental health advocate. 100% of the population can have their mental health improved. That's who Thrive New York City is taking care of. 20% have something in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. 4% of those over uh, 18 have a serious mental illness, meaning a functional impairment that they can't provide for their own health, safety, and welfare. The key statistic, 40% of the seriously mentally ill in New York got zero treatment. She said all the budget is spent on um, Thrive New York City. Gary Belkin told the Staten Island News that only 19%, 165 million of the age 65, that's a chart in here and I have the footnotes for all these. I calculated the budget and there's an appendix in here and I come up actually a little higher. In a best case scenario, I could say that 34% of the Thrive New York City 2020 budget, 250, is spent on the seriously mentally ill. As you can see, um, people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder count for uh, almost 70, 80% of discharges from psychiatric hospitals in New York. It is not people with anxiety, uh, they're not even on the list. So what that means is that if you focus resources on the seriously mentally ill, you can cut the need for hospitalization. If you focus it on people with anxiety and depression, you don't accomplish that. Um, of crimes committed in New York, and this will be state's figures, I don't have city, but don't believe they're different, 75% um, of the incarcerated are in there for uh, violent felonies. The percentage of Rikers inmates with mental illness is going up. The um, number of homeless mentally ill went up. There's charts in here on that, the number of EDP calls. And unfortunately, I, you know, I don't wanna take up anyone's time, but mental health first aid is not an evidence-based program. It's, there's research from the National Institute of Mental Health that shows no one with mental illness has ever been helped by it. The only research shows that those who take the course feel better about their ability to identify others. It makes people who take it feel better. We have extensive evidence on our site about that. Um, and I'm going to respect other I, people's yeah, time. I, I mean, I don't, I won't. What I will say about the mental health first aid is that as a, as, as a, the family member of several individuals with severe mental illness is that when it happened to us, there were enough of us that could not recognize the symptoms and that they didn't really, were not aware of what was happening to that individual. So in that respect, I think that, that the, the mental health first aid allows family members, and I'm a proponent that real people should be trained, not just uh, professionals, but mothers and caregivers and individuals that are uh, residing I, with someone right, that may I be. I fully understand that. There's no services to refer to. There's no evidence that learning about it that you'll refer, or that there's a place to refer to, or that the person will accept treatment if they go in. It is just, I mean, Understood. I have to say on this one, I'm sure. I <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, yeah, panelists. I think, uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Holden. By the way, uh, thank you for your uh, op-ed in the New York Post. It was educational. And, and uh, yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we looked at yours, and I'd like to be in contact with you so we could uh, we could discuss some more issues. Uh, I appreciate your, your perspective. Yeah. We have the most extensive collection of data on Thrive New York City, understanding they've published very little. Right, so thank you so much <laughs> for your service. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. My name is Amy Doran. I'm the president and CEO of the Coalition for Behavioral Health in New York, B 
the umbrella organization for over 100 community-based behavioral health providers. Uh, some comments regarding Thrive New York City. The coalition values its partnership with the city as we continue to move forward with enhancing Thrive New York's impact. Many of our community providers re receive Thrive New York City funding to address gaps in the service system, whether that be through our members' participation in the Mental Health Services Corps, New York City Well, or the provision of mental health first aid trainings. As we work together to create innovative models of care and services to improve health outcomes and the client experiences of care, and at the same time strive for cost effectiveness, the community-based behavioral health sector must be sufficiently utilized and encouraged to inform policy decisions and ensure access to timely, high-quality services and supports for New Yorkers in need. It is through the on-the-ground experience of our providers, their expertise, and firsthand understanding of the people they serve that can help to shape programs and maximize their impact. The coalition stands ready to collaborate with Thrive New York City to develop mutually agreed upon and clear benchmarks for success and clarify outcomes so that we can jointly assess success or make changes in programs that might need improvement. The massive trans transformation now taking place in the behavioral health arena, both for adults and more recently for children, is unprecedented and with significant challenges. The system is moving from a volume-based method of payment under Medicaid, where more is better, to a value-based system in which payers, the managed care plans, will reimburse providers based on positive outcomes they achieve in serving their clients. Therefore, now more than ever, data and technology are key if providers are to demonstrate value. The need for collecting data, tracking data, analyzing data is a must, and then and then the agencies must learn to take action on the data they are collecting. While very worthwhile, certainly it is expensive to acquire new and upgraded technology systems and soft software platforms. And leaders must help their workforces to understand the changes and adapt to them. And as we all know, culture change takes time. It is never easy and often uneven. The recent thrust that behavioral health services take place in the community rather than, the, than in the office is occurring for adults and for children. These are called HCBS, Home and Community-Based Services. We need high rates so that organizations can get and retain a workforce as, that is learning how to provide services in the home or community rather than in the office. Uh, supporting a healthy cycle, life cycle from children to uh, aging adults. The Coalition's Children's Committee provides a forum for discussion of some very complex issues involving children as well as older adults. Starting in January of 2019, New York State began to implement a broad reform of the children's behavioral health system after eight years of discussions on design and development. Uh, the move towards home and community-based services with an array of 11 services and transitioning care coordination that was previously included uh, is, uh, is referred to as case management. Uh, the Children's Committee at the Coalition provides a forum for discussion of these issues as well as issues pertaining to the increasingly large older adult population. Uh, it is challenging enough to age uh, but if you have a mental illness or substance abuse problem, the challenges are, uh, are much more increased. And the Coalition's aging, Healthy Aging Committee is trying to deal with some of these complex issues to make sure that our older adults get the care that they need. I'm going to stop. I'm out of time. Thank so. you, Amy. All right. You ready? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Hello, my name is Harriet LaSalle. I'm the Director of Government Contracts and Advocacy of JCCA. I want to thank the committee chair, Council Member Ayala, and the committee members and the staff uh, for the opportunity to testify today. JCCA is very appreciative of the Council's interest in behavioral health services. Um, I do want to say that I'm here that JCCA supports the whole um, request of the coalition for all of the uh, behavioral health and the um, 20 initiatives. These initiatives really represent flashpoints in the system where the council has stepped in to ensure that underserved populations have the resources they need and to enhance community resources in underserved populations. They are critically important parts of the system of care in New York City. Um, I'm just going to talk about three of them. Um, 
Uh, JCCA is requesting $175,000 for the Court Involved Youth Program. We feel very fortunate to have been a part of that program since the beginning. Um, the, the program is called Second Chances. It works out of Brooklyn. Um, and it has really been very successful in bringing in community partners, both for referrals into the program and then to be able to provide resources to um, youth and their families. And we're hoping to incorporate um, stipends for internships as part of our leadership group. Um, we also applied for the Opioid Prevention and Treatment Initiative for our Kesher program in Queens for $95,000. It serves hard to reach youth in the Orthodox community who are struggling with substance abuse issues. Um, with the grant, Kesha will incorporate addiction and prevention treatment into its array of services and really address the issues that that particular community has around you know, the denial and shame of, of what's going on. Um, we have also applied for the Medicaid Redesign Initiative as an agency that serves youth in foster care and youth with community behavioral health services. Wow, and I thought I was under two minutes. Um, we are, uh, JCC is at the forefront of tr the transition to Medicaid managed care. Um, and I could, I, I, you can read in my testimony what goes into why it is that agencies still need this. 2019 is the year for the Medicaid transformation for children's services, and there's a lot that goes on, workforce, infrastructure. And then lastly, um, I won't belabor, uh, this is the, um, the rollout of these new child and family treatment support services, a huge, a huge addition to the array of mental health services, preventive, they can be, um, uh, they can uh, address problems earlier for a lower threshold. And we think that the council has a real opportunity to help sort of ensure that city agencies partner with CBOs to make sure that the people who can obtain these services get them and, um, you know, JCCA remains you know, available to address that. And thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. I'm sorry. Is this on? Yes, it's on. Oh, great. Thank you. Good afternoon. How are you? Um, I'm Chris Norwood, Executive Director of Health People. Uh, recent intensive surveillance shows that now 16% of all New York City adults age 20 and older have diabetes with especially high rates among Latino, black, and increasingly Asian populations. The trouble with saying this is that we've now known for 20 years that diabetes is raging out of control, and rates are so high in low-income neighborhoods that it has injured and changed everything, including mental health. We are very aware of the rates of terrible physical complications like amputations, blindness, and dialysis that have shattered lives and families. Diabetes-related lower limb amputations alone have increased 55% in New York City since 2009. But there is less understanding of the disease's mental health impact. It is not just that diabetes is accompanied by enormous rates of depression and anxiety, from 25 to 40% of diabetics in most studies, but that it causes a special relentless condition now known as diabetes distress. This is the daily distress of having the disease that clouds your future and scares you. It is insane to think that we can comprehensively address mental health in New York without addressing a disease that affects 16% of the population and has a 25 to 40% rate of mental health complications. Yet the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene refuses to do anything. The health commissioner last week testified for an hour before the health committee and then today before this committee without saying the word diabetes once, the most prevalent disease in New York City and presented a budget of $1.6 billion, which doesn't have one dedicated budget line for evidence-based diabetes prevention and self-care. As the clearest preventable cause of depression, targeted diabetes prevention is not even included in Thrive. We have to depend on the council. Last year, the council asked for one million and got nothing. This year, please ask for three million and we can start training community groups across the city to provide education that really works, slashing depression, amputations, dialysis, Alzheimer's, the risk of Alzheimer's with diabetes goes up 40% in blindness. Thank you. Whoop. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Crossover TV. Um, Chris Norwood is uh, my boss, but she's a great person doing great things in the community. And uh, we joined her, and Crossover TV Live actually does amputation, um, diabetes amputation trainings on my live show. I took that initiative because both my parents uh, passed away from complications of diabetes. I'm not even reading what I wrote because I know my story. At the end of the day, diabetes affects every one of our organs. I'm going blind in my left eye. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be here to, um, to reach 55, I'm 49. My dad died at 47 on renal failure, kidney failure. My mom died at 64, bypass after bypass, then kidney failure. So I'm asking that you give that three point, we are coming to you for help. I've testified over and over and over. Um, and mental health, I think I just became very depressed three years ago when my mother passed away because I saw, I see no way out. You know, my, my eye surgeon told me that it's not what you did last year, it's what you did 10 years ago. We, d we didn't know, they were, we didn't know this program 10 years ago. If I was educated 10 years ago, and what I know now under the Stanford curriculum, I would have made better choices. So we need to make sure that the, our children that are coming up and our grandchildren, we wanna see them do great things. Well, it won't happen unless we get funding for education. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And just to say, we've never been asked one question. We testified so many times, and this, I'm just, I just had to say that. We've, I asked Chris the other day, I said, you know, we've never been asked a question after we testified. And it, 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 it's, 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 it worries me because I know that there's so many committees that need help and, and things like that. It, it, it shouldn't worry you. I actually was just thinking that we really haven't had a discussion where we're correlating uh, diabetes or chronic illness to uh, mental health as part of the discussion on Thrive. So mm -hmm. just because we're not asking doesn't mean that we're not thinking. Um, and I'm happy, I, I, I meet with Chris quite regularly and so the, the conversations, you know, are continuous. But thank you so much for coming to testify. And You're don't, welcome. Don't take the lack of questioning. As oh, no, no, I'm of, not. I listen, of disinterest. <laughs> I, listen, I love you guys. I love what you're doing for mental health. We have, like, Councilmember Gibson, uh, Councilmember King up on the show, and I'm just waiting to get you next. Yeah. Okay? Thank, thank you. you. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, oh, oh look. I, I just want to, this is not a question, but I. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I want to thank you both for educating me because I didn't, this is very enlightening. I, I mean, your testimony. M my mom suffers from diabetes and uh, she's blind in one eye yeah. and she has um, Alzheimer's. So, wow. um, so all the things that Chris so said. So all, yes. So I'm being educated uh, by you guys and I want to, I appreciate that. And I want to well, we thank you. you for listening to us. Thanks. And, and, and we, we want to help this community. We should fund this. I wrote on top fund this. Yay. So. Yay. Oh, sorry. I forgot. <laughs> We gotta right. do this, I'm sorry. Okay, let's go. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have two more panels. Uh, next panel is Catherine Celentano, Ken Robinson, Joyce Rivera, uh, Jose Rios, Alan Ross. Okay. Okay. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Chairperson Ayala and members of the Mental Health, Disability, and Addiction Committee for hearing my testimony today. My name is Jose Amrios, and I am an overdose prevention coordinator at Housing Works. I'm here today to talk to you about my friend Dina, who has inspired my work as an overdose prevention coordinator. Dina was the butter to my bread, and she was the breath to my soul. She was a close friend. I still vividly remember when I heard that Dina died of a heroin overdose in her uncle's bathroom, and her body wasn't found for more than six hours. 
She was 35 and was a mother to five children. I knew she was using opiates in pill form, but I didn't know she was consuming it in any other fashion. Dina's father had died around the same time she got out of prison and her tolerance for opioids had dropped while she was incarcerated, but she hadn't connected to any services to help her upon release. She had many people who loved her, but that wasn't enough to stop her death. At the time of Dina's death, I decided to train to use naloxone as an overdose prevention medication. I realize I can't do anything for Dina moving forward, but every overdose prevention training I do is in her memory. I served in the Army for 11 years and during the first Gulf War. I don't leave anyone behind, and I go above and beyond to answer the call of duty. I always carry naloxone with me at all times. I strongly support piloting, piloting overdose prevention centers in New York City, and I have followed that they are effective in Europe and in other places. We do need to have these facilities in place so that people like me can be there on site to reverse an overdose and save lives. Thank you so very much for your time. Okay. We can go if you give me some water. <laughs> it's a bar. You ready? Good evening. Uh, my name is Ken Robinson and I am the Executive Director of Research for a Safer New York Incorporated. Research for a Safer New York is a consortium of harm reduction providers and has been established to oversee a pilot research study in the form of the operation of overdose prevention centers in New York City and state. Overdose prevention centers are facilities that allow people to consume pre-obtained drugs under the supervision of trained staff. They are designed to reduce the health and public order issues associated with public drug consumption. OPCs can play a vital role as part of a larger public health approach to drug policy. They provide a health care intervention and are intended to complement, not replace, existing prevention, harm reduction, and treatment interventions. I am here to ask for $2 million in City Council discretionary funding. As you all know, we are in the throes of an opioid-induced public health emergency, and I've got some numbers here. I'm not going to read them to you. We all have heard them over and over again. We know how bad it is. Um, honorable council members, I implore you to fund this vital two-year pilot research project with $2 million in discretionary funding. We have worked very hard to have the pilot study authorized by New York State. We have great support in Albany in both the Assembly and the Senate and we are confident that we are on the verge of authorization. It is imperative that we have funds available once authorization is granted to immediately start building the infrastructure for this life-saving work. For every week, day, and hour that goes without overdose prevention centers, we pay the price in human lives. Ultimately, that's what this is all about, saving human lives. Thank you. Councilwoman uh, Ayala, um, thank you. Um, and Honorable o Ayala and um, Council Members, greetings. My name is Joyce Rivera, and I am the Executive Director of St. Anne's Corner of Harm Reduction. I'm also a board member of Research for a Safe in New York. As uh, Kenneth has said, it's a consortium of harm reduction providers. <clears throat> and as he has also said, OPCs are our facilities that allow uh, individuals to consume pre-obtained drugs under the supervision of trained staff. They are designed to reduce the health and public order issues associated with public drug consumption. Look, for over a century, New York City has been recognized as the heroin capital of the United States. And every day, thousands of persons consume heroin in New York City. And like other drugs, heroin can be consumed in several ways, but injection is the quickest way for the drug to reach the brain. In the 80s, the deadliest decade, the epidemic of injection-related HIV-AIDS was driven by penal laws that restricted access to syringes, artificially did so, and without access, drug injectors were forced to share contaminated syringes. Let's learn from this unnecessary tragedy. Today, we're experiencing a fentanyl-driven opioid epidemic. This is, we are currently in the third wave, I'm skipping, um, because it started in the 2000s with prescription opioid deaths, and, and it's currently now synthetic opioid death. And what I want to point out to you is that for the persons who sit at a bar, any bar, a hotel bar, any bar in New York City or the state or the country, and 
these are people who are using alternate drugs and their sense of safety rests upon successful management of their drug use. And a safe drug connection, the, the bar, the safe practices, and a safe place to consume drugs. And if you change any one of those variables, you are risking a drug-related harm, whether it's alcohol-related or opioid-related. Fentanyl tainted opioids and stimulants is indicative of such a change. Um, locally, um, unintended overdotes vary by race, borough, economic status, and ethnicity. 17% of our unintended overdoses occurred among persons within higher economic groups, those not living in poverty. So an unintended overdose does not discriminate. I'm gonna skip and just simply point out to you that drug-related harm is drug-related and it's practice-related and it's place-dependent. Where people inject drugs or consume drugs matters. And an OPC makes it possible to consume in a place where it is safe, where we can then refer them to services. If we take away that safety, we are just simply enabling an unintended overdose. We should not do that. Look, it's not just a grief that a family will suffer when they lose someone. It's also the shame and the disgrace. This is something that we as a society should really attempt to prevent. Not be, we should really support um, public health policies for public health issues and not, and not punishment, which has certainly not shown us anything else but more harm. Thank you. It's longer. I have it. I, I just wonder, I think that the complexity here is that I don't know how we fund something that the state has given us no indication on whether or not they will approve. And, you know, so I, I, I mean, any advocacy on behalf of, you know, the different groups and pushing um, the state to, to act, because I think it becomes an impediment for us as we're negotiating we're negotiating, you know, in goodwill, but we, we can't really, you know, we don't have any assurance. As you heard from the testimony of even the, you know, the, the New York City Department of Health Commissioner, um, even in their conversations, there has been no indication that this is gonna happen, you know, within a certain time frame. Well, it's, I'm happy to hear that. I mean, we certainly know that this, this is sort of like a, a political football, but yes. while this is being tossed back and forth, people are dying. You know, we have people are dying. Yeah. No, I agree. How many, how many by a minute? Seven by a minute? Yeah. Yep. Seven a minute. Yeah. And last year we were granted funds and uh, there was a negotiation that worked for the city. Um, be happy to talk about that yeah. with you if. Um, I'd, I'd appreciate that, yeah. Thank you. Who's next? But it was a way that, um, that, that the city's lawyers were satisfied with. Yeah. Okay. Hello um, to the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction and Chairwoman, Chairwoman Ayala. Um, I am pleased to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Catherine Salantano. I am Policy Coordinator uh, with the New York State Office of the Drug Policy Alliance. We are the nation's leading organization working to advance policies and attitudes to best reduce the harms of both drug use and the drug war. We're also a member organization of End Overdose New York, which is a statewide coalition of advocates, public health and healthcare professionals, faith leaders, family members of those struggling with opioid dependency, drug treatment providers, as well as people in recovery and people who are still actively using drugs. I also come to you as someone who, from, for about over the last 10 years of my life or so, has, has lost uh, many loved ones to overdose. So it's my pleasure to speak with you today. This is both my job and my personal interest and passion. Um, so uh, overdose prevention centers most simply are places that save human life. As others have pointed out, they provide space for people to, cons to consume pre-obtained drugs under the supervision um, of trained staff with access to sterile injection equipment. They provide opportunities for people to, connect it to uh, be connected to other services that meet uh, needs related to the drug use um, and also the context of that drug use. Um, and they're also a place that um, meet a very marginalized population with dignity. Um, so I'm here to uh, join others at this table in asking for uh, $2 million in city council discretionary funding. I think it's really, you know, given the volume of deaths that we're seeing, just the enormous 
Uh, the enormity of this crisis, which as we all know has already surpassed um, the apex of the HIV AIDS crisis, I think that timeliness component is really important. We need to be able to catch that ball um, when state authorization comes through. Um, as I'm sure folks may already know as well, um, this is not a, a new or untested solution. Overdose prevention centers have existed for, uh, you know, there's data that, that spans three different continents for almost four decades. Um, wow, that went fast. So anyway, you guys all know why these are so great. I'm glad this conversation is happening. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to promote health and public safety, and this is about saving lives. So I encourage you to uh, uh, grant the $2 million. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Christian and Mulder, President. Uh, my name is Tony Wong. I'm the Executive Director of Smile and Suicide Prevention. In this organization that's operating in New York City's 24-hour suicide hotline for over 35 years. Uh, so uh, we've operated the city's 24-hour uh, suicide hotline for over 35 years. Uh, I want to thank Chair Ayala uh, and uh, Committee Member Holden uh, for the opportunity to speak today. It is said that a society can be judged by how it responds to its most vulnerable members. Suicide's a barometer of our society. It tells us the quality of our lives, how we cope with problems, and how we help those in need. The suicide, that suicide and self-harming behavior, which touch people of every age, race, culture, sexual identity, and economic standing, continue to be on the rise is a chilling fact that alarms everyone here today. Samaritans is part of the world's oldest and largest suicide prevention network. We created the first suicide hotline over 65 years ago. We have centers in 42 countries. We've answered tens of millions of calls, work with the World Health Organization, the US Surgeon General, SAMHSA, NIMH, and countless government agencies, never asked to uh, provide feedback to Thrive as they were developing it. Um, um, we would have to say uh, that anyone who says they have an answer on how to prevent suicide is greatly misinformed. For no matter the research, uh, the development of massive government programs, the education and training that has taken place, suicides continued to rise for more than 10 years across the country, in the state, and in the city. Bigger is not always better, new is not always improved, and if every time there's an election we tear down what was there before, we're never gonna get very far. People in distress will seek help from someone they trust in a manner they feel comfortable and you can't dictate how they do it. You must have alternatives. And though there's many wonderful programs in Thrive, the city cannot be an alternative to itself. The US Air Force, boy, you're right, it is quick. Uh, the US Air Force Suicide Prevention Program presents the most effective blueprint in preventing suicide, what they call caring community, which is getting nonprofit, government, faith-based, community, cross-section of organizations working together in a collaborative network. That's not happening in the city today. Uh, when they implemented this program, they saw, this is documented, a 33% reduction in suicide, a 51% reduction in homicide, an 18% reduction in accidental death, and a 54% decrease in family violence. So there's proof that this kind of caring community program works, and it's a good reason to support Samaritans as well as other community-based organizations that are here today. Uh, unfortunately, when the mayor launched Thrive, though he stated he would enhance all existing mental health programs, many of the city's longest running crisis response services working on the front lines for many years saw their budgets drastically cut. Samaritans is an example. The day they thrive, uh, cut, uh, launched Thrive, we got an 85% cut in our hotline funding. Uh, three years later, we went from answering uh, 89,000 calls to just 75,000 calls. Now, hotline's only uh, a safeguard, but some of the latest research, which no one's talking about, is from Harvard that says people who decide to attempt suicide sometimes make the decision within 60 minutes of the thought. So all these prototypical large types of programs aren't gonna impact 50% of the people that are attempting suicide. So we're asking for you to continue. Uh, Samaritans wouldn't be here without the council support. For four years, you've restored our hotline contract. We thank you so much for it. We have a request again for the 297 hotline restoration. 
We are asking for a $50,000 uh, uh, um, enhancement. We know enhancements are hard to come by, but with COLA, no, we don't get COLA when you give us money. Uh, with all costs, health costs, we're $75,000 down from what we're getting each year. So we ask that you consider supporting us and the other community-based programs that are essential and element of the city's caring community. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm sorry? No, I said I appreciate it. Thank you so yeah. much. And I, just on a, a sidebar, uh, and this is self-focused, uh, 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 I've personally been doing suicide prevention training and professional development work for 35 years in New York City. I would welcome the opportunity to talk to you about first aid and the other government-funded uh, programs. I understand that you would see the importance of identifying and recognizing, but that's not the problem. The problem is people are uncomfortable talking about suicide. Their communication skills, I'm sorry to say, are terribly lacking. So it's not what they're training, it's what needs to come before the training, and that's sadly missing. So I would certainly welcome the opportunity. I'm, I'm happy to sit with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thank you guys. Our final panel is Greg Waltman, Chris Copeland, Nicholas Besada, Ted uh, Hewton, Efrain Gonzalez III, and Dion Powell. Thank you for holding out. You guys are troopers. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Council Ayala. Respective Council, Greg Waltman from G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company. Uh, I just wanted to take the time to parse through a couple issues. Um, the first lady, out of context, quoting out of context, said she was responsible for the amplification of uh, the Thrive New York City initiative. And out of context, quoting uh, Council Rosenthal, she said that this Thrive New York City agency was derived through a type of silo constituency um, value-based. <clears throat> and I just wanted to take the time to just break down some of those issues as it may anecdotally relate to uh, fiscal year 2020 and the vision building forward for uh, the city, um, it seems that the council um, offers a pretty big audience to value constituencies, Columbia University. I was at an um, expert panel last, last night, um, 89, and they seemed more towards getting rid of borough presidents and things like that. And, and I just wanted to take a step back and, and, and just reanalyze maybe the 1.8 that was quoted billion dollar impropriety. Is, is that the first lady's issue or is that the value Columbia University imposing upon the first lady to execute something that um, maybe wasn't morally founded? And, and I just wanted to take a more objective kind of approach to that and then also add to, um, I guess, Councilman Holden's um, comments on, on the subway. In adjusting that impropriety or alleged, uh, there's technology, quantum track technology, my companies thrive, that you know, as we go through these track enhancements, I would argue that they're obsolete track enhancements, you can create opportunity where you can go back and refurbish the track and create the first ever self-sustainable city in the world. So, you know, whether it be, um, you know, setting forth a superior course of action for the city and as it prepares its budget, I would just re-look re and, and, and see what options are available in these track enhancements as it pertains to different types of budgetary fiscal gaps that have uh, been imposed upon the council. Thank you. Madam Chair and members of this committee, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Efren Gonzalez III. I work at Montefiore Medical Center. I was just recently attacked by an EDP, and I wanted to come here because I wanted 
this committee and, and the public to know that sometimes we think we know everything, but in my case, we didn't see it coming. Yes, I do agree that there has to be a mandated uh, watch with healthcare personnel and security in all hospitals. That is a protectiveness that will have to probably go through the state legislature, but I wanted this committee to know. Also, Thrive New York City, I was enlightened today because for years, for a few years, this council has approved the budget for Thrive New York City. But one thing I did not hear was that direct care for mental health uh, patients. Direct, where we're taking our money and we're making sure, just like in a hospital where they have administrators getting money, we want that money to go directly to patient care, and that's not happening. Now, it doesn't mean that we're gonna fix it all in one budget. It's gotta be a systematic approach where that we progressively correct the gaps because there are people that refuse to seek help. So Kendra's law will never apply to them because they're gonna have to be apprehended if they do something wrong, and we have to have compassion. I don't agree with everything that this administration does, but I'm not here to rip the mayor or the first lady because that's not what this committee is about. This is about what are we going to do to find solutions? Getting the state legislature to work with the city council and making sure that the communities where all of the Thrive New York City intervention is going, and, and there's nothing wrong with having community centers involved, and if I may close, but we have to make sure that funding in the age of this Medicaid cut that has been bombarded on us, that we make sure that we do have in this budget direct funding to the hospitals, not just the one I work for, but the ones to help treat mental illness properly and effectively. We'll never protect anyone from who's gonna commit suicide because sometimes the one who knows the most is the police officer that gets the 911 call and he has to call for a bus. So it's shocking, but we all have to work with each other. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dion Powell. I'm from the North Pole of New York City, which is the Bronx, New York. I've battled a mental illness since 14 uh, in and out of psych wards. Uh, coincidentally, I'm a former community liaison for New York State Assembly for a certain politician. Um, I just want to say that I'm so happy with my Bronx delegation and also that we have people of color and decision-making power for mental illness. And coincidentally, you know, 2021, perfect transparency, there's going to be over 40 vacancies in City Council, and I too plan to run. So I'm happy with Jamani Williams and Richie Torres for fully disclosing their conditions. Um, also, Councilwoman Ayala, coincidentally, I have family and friends that live in your district, both in the South Bronx side and on the Manhattan side. So I will be coming seeing you and bringing them with me. Okay, but you said something that's very key that we need to know in this mental illness business, because it's a business now and there's a lot of money to be made for everybody, which is you cannot force help. I'll say it again, you cannot force help. And that's very key to our communities. Now, here are my proposed solutions for your budget, which is that this, um, meta, meta, um, this mental illness, meta, um, first aid training is nice and all, but it doesn't solve the problem. Social service is a big business, now mental illness is a big business. Well, capitalism. So here are my recommendations. I recommend that we hire and train people from our community to become psychiatrists. How are we gonna do this? You guys should partner with CUNY Sophia Davis program to pump out these psychiatrists that should be recruited, trained from our community. For example, this disconnect between the psychiatrist and our community. You know, funny quick story. I had a psychiatrist who didn't know the term baby mama. I'll say it again. I had a psychiatrist who didn't know the term baby mama. And that's a disconnect that needs to be highlighted. And then these jobs in mental illness and social services are nothing. Careers in psychiatry and the medical profession are very key to uplifting our community. And the last point is we should also train our community, once again with Social Davis and everything else, in the pharmaceutical industry. That's another multi-billion dollar industry that we could take jobs from and careers that we need in our community. For people that look at us. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Oh, go ahead. Oh, wait, see, I have my own. Dion, turn, can you turn yours off? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Ayala and the distinguished members of this committee. 
On behalf of the members and staff of Fountain House, I thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Uh, my name is Nicholas Becerra, and I am the Director of Government Relations at Fountain House. Uh, so as, as, as you guys might know, Fountain House is a community-based mental health recovery center that offers access to comprehensive services for people with severe and persistent mental illness. Through our community system of care, which combines primary and psychiatric care with social interventions, people with serious mental illness are not only connected to treatment, but also to tangible opportunities to live and thrive in mainstream society. Importantly, our model is and continues to be driven by people with serious mental illness themselves. For over 70 years, we have served a segment of the mental health community considered by most to be beyond help. Individuals with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depression. Once joining our program, not only have these individuals sought treatment, but they have recovered and become contributing members of society. Our comprehensive approach pro proves to be a cost-efficient, culturally adaptable, and evidence-based solution to a growing mental health crisis in our city. According to a recent research study by NYU, high, utiliz li excuse me, high utilizers of Medicaid services have a 21% decrease in the total cost of care after enrolling in Fountain House. So when a mayoral administration prioritizes the issue your organization has been addressing for 70 years, it's impossible not to feel hopeful. As an organization, we are grateful there has been a coordinated effort to rethink mental health policy in our city. Public dialogue is vital as we advance our thinking about how to support those with the most serious forms of mental illness. I think it's fair to say that this initiative, Thrive NYC, has moved the needle by encouraging those most affected with mental illness to seek help, and I am here today to tell you that we have felt that impact. Fountain House was not a funding recipient of Thrive NYC. However, since the initiative's launch in 2016, Fountain House in Hell's Kitchen uh, and our Bronx affiliate have experienced an 82% increase in the number of applications made to our program. This number is significantly higher than in previous years, and we believe the awareness component of Thrive NYC has been a factor that contributed to this increase. In fact, membership at Fountain House Bronx, which is in the chairwoman's district, uh, has increased so steadily over the past three years that it's poised to soon reach its maximum capacity of 200 people. To respond to this need, Fountain House is currently in the process of developing a larger Bronx site, which may include a supported housing facility, uh, which addresses another critical need of our population, supportive housing. Um, our work in the Bronx is a great example of what's possible if the right investments are made. Comprehensive programs like Fountain House are not only addressing the mental health needs of the community, but also help to address issues of high incarceration, homelessness, rehospitalization, and poverty. We strongly believe it's time for Thrive NYC to expand and enhance its impact by supporting, partnering, and learning from community-based mental health organizations serving those with serious mental illness. With support from city government, Fountain House and its affiliates are uniquely positioned to help build capacity of services for people with SMI in high need areas. Only then can we effectively address the seemingly intractable social problems of homelessness, incarceration, and excessive hospitalization that plague city government, drain our resources, and damage the quality of life in our city. Uh, I thank you for your time and attention to this important matter. Thank you. You're hearing the music from the party next door, so on the and when we wrap up, you can just slide right into the, the festivities. <laughs> I won't keep you long then. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, testify this afternoon. My name's uh, Chris Copeland. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Institute for Community Living. Uh, we're one of the lo New York's largest health care and housing organization providing support and treatment services to nearly 10,000 adults, children, and families living with mental illness, substance abuse, and developmental disabilities. For more than 30 years, ICL's programs have been helping New Yorkers of all backgrounds achieve greater health and independence. And we share with you and mental health leaders across New York City a commitment to bringing critical service to those most at risk, particularly those with severe mental illness and chronic homelessness who are often without family or community connection. Uh, at ICL, we don't turn anybody away. We stay with each person on their journey to recovery. Many of our programs are provided in partnership with or through the support of New York City's Department of Health 
for mental health and including Thrive. Uh, last September, uh, you joined us at the opening of our new comprehensive health and behavioral health center with our medical service partners, the Community Health Network. The East New York Hub brings, to get, brings under one roof primary and mental health care and vital connections to community resources. And in just six months of operation, we began to see improvements in the care for community members for whom high quality health care was never accessible or were forced to travel to, to other parts of the city to, to get care. And we suggest this needs to be the model demanded for all funders uh, for services across the city. ICL um, the programs funded by the city include uh, in intensive mobile treatment teams, you've heard about those already, supported housing programs including a forensic supported housing program in the Bronx, and of course um, we, we, we also provide shelter services uh, for people with, particularly women and veterans with, mental, with severe mental illness. I think the important point about these is that they all provide support and direct treatment, um, all, the, all these services provide support and direct treatment for people with severe mental illness, and I think it's important to note that, that that treatment and public, s and public safety are really the, both si the different sides of the same coin. However, all these services rely on people getting sick first. Uh, and public health approach shouldn't wait for people to get ill. Um, we are funded by the city for our family resource center, which does provide uh, preventative services for children. But, the, but importantly for this discussion, we, we've benefited from Thrive's community partners in caring initiatives including uh, hosting mental health first aid training for, for clergy. A core component of Thrive is preparing professionals and others working with people most at risk. And we've been able to expand uh, the reach of our mental health services uh, by, by placing uh, 15 Thrive New York City mental health service call workers. And we continue to work uh, with Thrive to enhance the co collaboration with clergy to provide tools for them to be a service as frontline responders. Uh, I think in terms of being the first line responders for people in, uh, in desperate need and suicide, the clergy provide a huge resource. I'd, like to just, uh, I'd also like to stress that it, it do, through all this, we really are challenged with the process, the contracting process with the city. It forces us to reapply for basic operational funding, and it's also a lengthy and difficult process. Um, we urge the council to, pro approve, uh, to approve baseline budgets with multi-year funding that allows programs to plan for ongoing needs and specifically, uh, while we're very grateful to secure $249,000 of city funding for the forensic program in the Bronx, it would be, it would be easier and, uh, uh, for us to, instead of reapply, reapplying each year, to do long-term planning for these folks. And the length of time in difficulty in contracting with the city delays essential services and comes with a constant fear of delayed payments and, and cash flow problems. I hear the second buzzer, uh, and I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> Thank you all for waiting such a long time. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. This meeting is adjourned.